from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan. It's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. Is that copyrighted? Like, is that like that guy, Wolfman Jack? Was that his shtick? I I, I don't I, think you can copyright the idea, the like concept of howling. of howling. You could concept the the name, maybe. I mean, if if like uh, if I w- was a radio DJ with a syndicated show calling myself Wolfman Paul, he might have a some kind of hey, wait a legal minute. basis. But I he's. I, I don't know when, you know, for all I know, he's still on the air somewhere, but um, that was quite some time ago. It seems unlikely that he'd be still. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't want you infringing on my intellectual property. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. So. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. So uh, this is going to be a chatty show. Yeah, we're just going to talk. We're going to talk. um we're going to get through, uh, we're finally going to confront the big topic that we've, we've been, been threatening to for for like once now. Yeah. I, I keep wanting to do a show called Our Failure in Saginaw. Yeah. And talk about everything we tried to achieve and how it how we failed at it. Right. But actually, I changed the, the title. I started oh. putting together the title. So okay. the title is Saginaw, comma, America. Oh. Because I believe our story is bigger. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you like to talk about how Detroit is the needle that every major American city has to pass through. Yeah. The, yeah. the eye of that needle. Yeah, you pass, you gotta thread that. Um, thread that needle. And I think in a way, uh, that's the story of Saginaw, is the story of all, you know, that uh, anyone in a deindustrialized town, Rust Belt or otherwise, right, may have to th- navigate as navigate well. Navigate and confront. And right. so, I think maybe that broadens out our story a little bit, rather a than just bit. making it our our, just, uh, just our own personal personal thing. bitch fest. <laughs> <laughs> Although a personal a personal bitch fest, at least our friends, you know, probably here for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but still. I I really hate to just I I, I try to watch just myself complaint. closely, for ever like just indulging in complaint and whining, and I know I do sometimes, but I try oh, not yeah, to. Yeah, I, it, well, I I at least like to you know hang a lampshade on it and call it what it is. Right, yeah. but you know we're so but blessed. Not pretend it's anything else. We're so blessed in so many ways. It just feels wrong to really have any complaints. To really complain. Yeah. But first, I realized oh, looking at uh, my last five or six weeks of blog posts yeah. that we're well behind on updating people on reading and, and watching. watching. Oh my, that's true. And this is one of my favorite little segments, segments to do. It's true. It's true. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention. You're going to help me stay on task here yeah. and not make this two hours. Two hours just of introduction. Just of introduction. Because I can easily... That's the thing about being an English major, the occupational hazard of being an English major, is I can easily spool out hours, gibberish about, <laughs> about any book that I really like and get into. Right. I can just keep or, talking or really about hated. it. Or really hated, yeah. yeah. It's it's the mediocre and different ones that, but even those sometimes I'll try and pick apart what went wrong. Went wrong, yeah. So, but so this first up, first up, the thirteen clocks. Oh, that was fun. By James Thurber. Yeah, we read that with the kids. I, I've I've liked that book for a long time. Tell tell me, uh, tell the listeners what you liked about it and your early experience with that book. Oh, okay. I was afraid you were going to ask me to summarize. I'm like, uh, on the spot. You don't have to summarize my, the plot. Um, Honestly, the plot isn't the real... It's not the real jam. <laughs> ...point of It's the a book. little bit, I think, hard to follow. Yeah. But no, the um, the uncle was just so evil. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that was actually my favorite thing. And even then, 
like as a nine year old, uh, yeah. year old, I I loved a good bad guy. I yeah. mean, and like an, like as uh, Twain says, you know, an honest lie, like an honest bad guy. He's just bad. Okay, right, right. He's the evil character in the story. He's our foil. You don't need to know why. You don't need to talk about his mother. No, he's just no, a bad guy. No, you don't. It's kind of like. Um uh, what uh, in uh, Much Ado About Nothing, the yes. Shakespeare <laughs> yeah. play, where the, the villain is just a villain. And just a villain. Like, he's just there to fuck shit up, you know? There's no connection to the characters. There's no backstory. There's no, like, he's never redeemed. He disappears halfway he disappears. through, you know? It's he's, like, you know? He's a little plot monkey. That's it. That's right? it. That's all. <clears throat> yeah. This... And, and so I've always appreciated that bad guy. Yeah. Because... If you're if you're an actor playing that villain, you can just chew the scene, chew it all up. Yeah. If you're writing that villain, yeah, you can again just chew it all up, and right. you can be bad in ways that could never work. Right. In, in a more in a more sophisticated setting. Piece. Right. Right. So um so yeah that that was my favorite <clears throat> thing, and then also just the sort of um, the sophistry with the uh, oh gosh I'm gonna forget their names now the um those two spies. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. And then the clocks themselves. Yeah. Well, what I really liked about it was just was the language, because I love mm-hmm. clever language. Right. And so you have, I'm going to quote it for, it for a bit. You have jokes like this. The Duke, he clapped his hands, to, his gloves together, and two varlets appeared without a word or sound. Take him to the dungeon, said the Duke. Feed him water without bread, and bread without water. <laughs> <laughs> But so that's like a low grade little gag that makes right. you scratch your head. Wait a minute, what? But um, then he keeps slipping in verbal ty- pyrotechnics. He keeps changing style and changing meter and changing rhyme just constantly. Right. So you get a, a couple paragraphs like this. The task is hard, said Zorn, and can't be done. I can do a score of things that can't be done, the Golux said. I can find a thing I cannot see and see a thing I cannot find. The first is time. The second is a spot before my eyes. I can feel a thing I cannot touch and touch a thing I cannot feel. The first is sad and sorry. The second is your heart. What would you do without me? Say nothing. Nothing, said the prince. Good, then you're helpless and I'll help you. (laughs) So, (laughs) and then you get like, Sometimes he does a deep dive into alliteration. Mm-hmm. The brambles and the thorns grew thick and thicker in a ticking thicket of bickering crickets. Farther along and stronger bonged the gongs of a throng of frogs, green and vivid on their lily pads. From the sky came the crying of flies, and the pilgrims leaped over a bleeding sheep creeping knee-deep in a sleepy stream, in which swift and slippery snakes slid and slithered silkily, whispering sinful secrets <laughs> the kid when i like read that when i see a passage like that coming and i'm reading it out loud i speed way up and like read it as fast as i possibly can and the kids yeah. are like <laughs> just lose just, their baby uh, minds they just scream with delight it's hilarious yes uh internal rhymes everywhere like there ought to be stanzas Look, the Goluk said, and listen, the Princess Sarah Linda will never wed this youth until the day he lays a thousand jewels upon a certain table. I would weep for Sarah Linda, Haggis sighed, if I were able. Internal rhymes, right? Right. And there's some real verses, too. There was an odd coddle so molly. Er, sorry. There was an old coddle so molly. He talked in a glot that was Polly. His gauze were so gew that his laps became dew, and he ate only pops that were lolly. <laughs> That's so, kind of pops. So those turn into molly coddle, polyglot, gew ga, dew lap, and lollipops. Yes. And uh, the kids just uh, are just delighted, delighted by with that. this kind of game. The older kids, at least. The younger ones are like, what is this story about? Yeah, about what's happening in this story? All right. Yeah. Not much is happening. Not really, you know, it's just the, it's there for the, you're there for the jokes. Okay, so that's one book. Book one, book two. Babylon Five. This isn't a oh, book. Oh, watching, watching yeah. Babylon Five. We watched the uh, 
pilot the pilot movie yeah so i actually with sam one evening since he was the only one that had been good i brought yeah. him down and we watched <laughs> we watched disc one of season one and it wasn't even so like like uh reward and punishment per se it was just like you guys i'm sick of waiting for you to finish i'm moving on with my life right and you know? so i brought sam down and we watched this thing um so, yeah, it got me, you know, again, you rewatch something you've seen before and you see it differently, right? Yeah, yeah. And no mostly Babylon 5 has held up better than almost any other TV science yeah. fiction show that yeah. I've seen. Because the thing is, even at the time, you had to suspend disbelief to deal with, like, the costumes and the sets and all the, that. Right? The, the and the CGI. The computer imagery especially. Right. At the time, yes. you had to just kind of, like, <clears throat> put that on the table. So it's kind of like a really high-quality production, a uh, theater production. That like has a stage stage play, almost. With, with low-budget theater props. Yep. It doesn't matter that it's low-budget props. No. The production is good. And a few of the shows are actually pretty bad. There's one in the first uh, disc called Infection, and Straczynski actually regards that as like the worst single episode of the I show. I don't remember this one. What's it's this? pretty bad. It's like some alien artifact dug up and infects people like a, a mind virus. It's cheesy with lots of like glowing electrical glowing effects. And screaming. And, yeah, ah, lots of screaming. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, it's it's okay. a very standard. Sci-fi hoary, hoary. old sci-fi trope okay you know? I, that's probably why i don't remember it. <clears throat> yeah. you know, this isn't the one where there's like a plague no because that's that, I thought that was very that's, good that's much better that's much later right yeah but so you know if i compare these to like how does this whole series which had a story arc a defined story arc and a mm -hmm. plan from the get-go right compare right. to shows like the Next Generation, Voyager, Voyager SG One, Andromeda. Oh, God. The floor of Babylon Five was just a lot higher off higher. the ground. Right. I mean, like Next Generation had maybe an individual individual episodes that were very good, like some Babylon Five episodes, or maybe better. Right. But the overall quality and engagement. It's not so much. Well, no, I I think <clears throat> probably the worst of Babylon Five. Yeah. It would be would have been pretty good for some of uh, many of these other shows. Yeah, the right? worst of Babylon Five was still better than most of Andromeda, aside yes. from like the pilot and one or two other yeah. shows. The Andromeda's pilot was good, and I was, I I just kept hanging on because we the pilot was frustrated. It was so frustrating. There was a, yeah. an occasional show that was worth watching yeah. a little later, but then like so we stuck with it just to figure out can it really have gotten this, this bad? bad? And yeah, well, and I had this sort of like. Like secret hope that maybe this was maybe like they'd pull it together. They were setting something this up. This was something they were setting something up, yeah. and they were going to bring it back to the original sort of plot points, the right. original plot direction. And I was just kind of no, because the pilot was pretty good. It fell apart, and oh, just a complete. And yeah. they just milked it as long as they could, even yeah, with guess. after the original. I guess everyone was getting paid. Was fired. You know? Yeah, they yeah. just keep showing up. Yeah, so. But no, I so I do like Babylon Five and yeah. and still enjoy it and um, I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute. Yeah, just a minute. Okay, because um, there's another movie that we watched that I found at Meyer on a discount <laughs> shelf. <clears throat> it was out like oh, nine ninety nine. I could take that home. I haven't seen that in a long, okay. long time. More than thirty years. This movie is called The Last Starfighter. Yep. And. Uh, yeah, I watched this back in 1984 and it was really illuminating because everything that was dumb about it now, watching it at 50, I understood and noticed at, it was dumb then. at 16. Yeah, it was right. dumb then. Yeah. It was dumb then and, and also the things that were good about it. They were it, good and fun. I enjoyed then. Right. So, uh... Yeah, there are two things I there, there are some things I really like about it. The practical sets are pretty good. Yeah. They're fun. This the the like alien sets are fun. Mm -hmm. um, and the alien costumes are fun too. And sort of the stage play look of the trailer park and the way that stuff is done is yep. fun, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of sound stage scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, two of the supporting actors are really quite notable. Robert Preston, who was a famous 
actor played in Music Man. Who is he playing he in the movie? He plays uh, Centauri. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The like con man slash recruiter. Um, yes. His character's not very well written. It's all a mess, but he's but he still very charismatic on screen. Every every scene he's in, he's totally stealing it because he's just very charismatic to right. watch. Um Greg, played by Dan O'Herlihy, he's a lizard-faced alien, mm-hmm. and his face doesn't really move much, like his rubber yeah, no. mask, but he still manages to be a very appealing character, just appealing with his voice. Motive. Right, yeah. yeah. Just with his... Uh, so he does a fantastic job. Yeah. 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 Um, but... Uh, Even in his uh, lizard costume. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, Alex, the protagonist, played by Lance Guest... Um, He's not a bad actor because he does some cool stuff with his robot double and all that that required a little bit of acting skill. Yep. But he's way too old for the role. I, and I think I noticed that. Yeah, you then. said he, this guy is 24. And I, I looked it up and figured it out. He's a, He was 23. He was 23, right. But he was playing a kid who was supposed to be 17 or 18. Yeah. It just, it's just yeah. really not that convincing. Not plausible. Yeah, and then... When you're watching it now, you're like all the the people in the trailer park. Whenever they pan over like a group scene with people talking one or two lines each, you're like, mm-hmm. "Oh yeah, that lady," and "Oh yeah, yeah that that, la- guy. that guy," and you're like, like every uh, sitcom actor. from the '70s, every character actor from the '70s. I looked at some of them up. Barbara Boson, she was in Hill Street Blues. Yep. yep. Right. Um, and there's another bizarre surprise in the credits. Yes. Uh, Will Wheaton apparently had a very small speaking role as the friend of the younger brother of the protagonist who just was in like one or two scenes. His scenes were actually cut. Cut. Like his speaking lines were actually cut. cut. But he was still credited. He was still credited. And he appears like in the background, almost more like an extra role. Right. Uh, And but you'd have to freeze frame it to try and hunt him. him. I could not find him. Um, yeah. and but apparently he's there. He's there. And like I thought somebody online would have like a f- blowed up freeze frame showing what he looked like in that movie, but I couldn't find, couldn't the, find the it. picture. I guess you're the guy who has to do it, Paul. Oh, God. I'm not I'm not that kind of a fan. I just you're thought it was funny. Right. No. But uh, apparently he still gets like a hundred dollar residual check a year for being a credited actor in this film because it still sells enough copies that they have to pay them some tiny, tiny... And that's what a union does for you. Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) But no, I don't think they... Since they cut his scenes, I don't think they needed to leave him in the credits. He could have just been an extra, but they did. He probably had a contract. He, uh, well, maybe. But I think he also had maybe family connections or something. Oh, you think? Well, anyway... So yeah, but so those are the things I like about the movie. But the movie is slow. Uh-huh. There are scenes in it where the tone is all wrong, yeah. like like the first uh, reveal of the like robot Alex is this horrifying, it's horrifying creature, and it was re- just really funny. It looks like he's like been the scene s- was really funny. Yeah, and then ah! <laughs> yeah, right. You see him, and he looks like he's actually been skinned alive. It's yes, this it's gruesome really looking gruesome. thing. Yeah. Uh, and I remember being horrified by that at at sixteen in the theater, like going, "That doesn't fit at all." I and I well, was because no, we just had this really funny scene right. where he's talking to himself, right? And his little right. brother wakes up and he's right. like, "What's going on?" I just go back to sleep, or I'll show mom your Playboys. Right? He's like, <sighs> like you know, yeah. he's dead asleep yeah. now. And then, dun dun. <laughs> yeah, this weird reveal, right? right. But th- but then he gets better, I guess. <laughs> It got better. There's a lot of scenes that are really laughable. There's a scene where the, all the teenage characters are riding at night in the back of a pickup truck. Yes. Which is clearly just a really uh, blurry rear projection thing yeah. with like a fan blowing on them to make it look like the wind's blowing in their hair. <laughs> it's so yeah. bad. It's yeah. so bad. Um, the CGI itself is... It was some of the earliest real cgi used in a film yeah. along the, around the time of tron mm-hmm. it was not very good and no. in some scenes it just looks awful um you're kind of like why'd they waste the money yeah so i mean okay. the spaceship views are pretty cool but then you know his his um uh centauri 
like his flying car, his, his flying, flying car. spaceship car. Yeah. That was a pretty cool space flight. It was a pretty cool yeah. space flight, even if the graphics are primitive. But right. primitive didn't really bother me, but when things just look weird and confusing. It's like, huh, what's happening here? There's a point where they hide in an asteroid, uh, mm-hmm. in a set of hollow cave in an asteroid. Mm-hmm. And the outside, like the exterior, is just this weird looking glop, like CGI glop. Like yeah. you can't, there's no structure or. It doesn't make any sense. It, visually, it's just kind of a. Like as you're watching, you're kind of like, is that the asteroid he's talking about? It's like watching a terrible screensaver or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, they're moving through this thing, but you can't even tell that they're moving through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of moving through it. <laughs> Grace is like making wind this up gestures. If I make the gesture yes. and then you tell them, it's, it really doesn't work for it to be silent. Work. No, okay. <laughs> anyway, last Starfighter, seventy six percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Bad CGI. Way too old actor. Feels long and slow. The kids still enjoyed it. They did. The older kids were able to really yeah, engage because, uh, yeah, it it's got its moments. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I forgot to mention a book that I've been reading at. This is called Not What Happened by Hillary Rodham Clinton. But What Happened to Bernie Sanders <laughs> by Jared H. Beck, Esquire. Yeah. The the uh, publisher copied the, the graphical layout of Hillary's book, which mm-hmm. is blue with his right. text half blue and white, right? Right. And Sanders is red and white. Who's that? <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah. yeah, she really yeah. played with the the Democrat colors, right? In her yeah, her logo did. featured a red arrow pointing, pointing to the, the right. right, right. But then for her for her apologia, you know, her self serving book, it was blue, blue imagery. Yeah, and things used to be the other way. Like <sighs> blue bloods were the rightest. Yeah. I, I don't even know. I don't, I don't even know. know. It's confusing. Anyway, this book is um, it is a, an account of all the shenanigans that the DNC and all these fundraising bodies and whatnot did to basically throw the primary, to skew the primary, to right. uh, and there's still court cases in progress about still this pending, and WikiLeaks and other sources are still leaking out drips and drabs of information showing just. What a catastrophically well, you can't stupid! Believe WikiLeaks. <laughs> just what a catastrophically stupid series of idiot consultants and other f- associ- you know, assorted so, fuck ups, uh, right? Brought this all about, right? Be sure to vote for them in November. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, yeah, to uh, refuse to nominate the most popular politician in America. But whatever, you know, yeah. it's her turn. Okay, so you mentioned Babylon Five in the beginning. Oh, right? the uh, yeah, the pilot movie. Well, I, I call it the pilot movie, but I looked into it a little more, and it didn't actually come out until like after year four of the show. Oh, huh. Right, and it it was um it is chronologically uh, a prequel. Right. So it's like if you're watching the show for the first time, uh, you should watch this movie uh, after season four, episode nine, Atonement. That's, oh, right. You'll Because there's a lot of spoilers. Because there are a lot of spoilers. Now I know like the whole story spoilers, by right? now, but mm-hmm. um, it, it reveals a lot of things that have been hinted at uh, mm-hmm. so thus far in right. the series, right? And you know what? I swear to, I swear to God. Yeah. There was, wasn't there a scene at the end of that, like the guy brings him his brandy, and he's like, he's going to drink it all, right? And then he wants another one. Uh-huh. And so... Uh, uh, Londo. Londo. Um, and he's alone. And then... Um, oh, gosh, Robert. Jakar. Jakar. Like, slips in behind his behind, throne. Behind a, and a Garrett's curtain. Him. And, and Garrett's him. Doesn't that happen? You know, I, there is. I think so. But I don't remember whether it's a, a scene that is representing Londo's dream or whether it really happens really happen. in the show. Okay, all right. Because he I, has a prophetic dream about that he and Londo will kill each other at the right. end. Right, at the end, the two of right. them are locked in combat I, to the very end. But I think, I don't know, I, don't, I, have to, I have to watch it. the rest of it again. Oh, poor us. Yeah. 
I'll have to watch again. But here, here's a weird digression. Okay, so years ago, when I first saw this, I w- didn't watch it in order, and I missed most of it, but occasionally I would catch an episode. Right. And I saw an episode of, of Babylon 5, way out of order, way f- late in this in the series, that I was absolutely convinced um, totally took its plot line from Frodo and Sam traveling into Mordor to throw the Ring of Power into Mount Doom. Okay, was okay. Like it takes place amid all these volcanic eruptions and these two. Is that Zaha Doom? Well, that's what I thought, but then when like later when we watched the whole sh- series, I don't, I didn't come across the episode that I remembered. Oh, that's weird. But it's what's weird about it is that Straczynski was a big Tolkien fan, and he makes all kinds of Tolkien references, references right? and whatnot to Tolkien. So, I mean, it makes sense, but like I wrote it all down. I wrote down all these notes, all these parallels and everything, because it was just literally the, the plot like, of, whoa, of hey. the end of uh, the Two Towers, the beginning, you know. Right. Um, and... Uh, but now I can't find it. Like, I can't find the episode. And so I'm still trying to figure that out because it's like I have strong memories of some scenes. This isn't like that show that was like half-assed uh, sketches where you like imagined it was something else? No. Okay. No. Just checking. No. Grace is referring to um, uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Yeah, like the like the last. Episode I watched of the, last the whole series. Or yeah, and like the last episode of the last season wasn't even a proper episode because they had been canceled and run out of money or something. Right. And they assembled an episode out of like fra- fragments and sketches and incomplete animation animatics that they didn't finish. Right. And I watched this and I was blown away by this amazing <laughs> deep, <laughs> like like oh the whole thing makes sense now. <laughs> They've revealed like the hidden meaning behind all the story arc, and I came up with like coherent explanation for how like all the events of the show took place in the characters' psyches. They were, right. they they all took place in the characters' heads, and all the events of the show to date were representations of the Jungian archetypes of the people in their imagination. Right? <sighs> yeah. And it's like, no, they. They just ran, just ran out, of, out money. of money, and these were all unfinished scenes and bits and pieces they couldn't use elsewhere. I'm like, oh shit! All right. So okay, sometimes, mind, like, <laughs> sometimes, uh, you know, you might think more than the producers did. <sighs> well, so, sometimes I'm capable of creating meaning where n- none next exists. none exists or next to none exists. Right? Yeah, yeah, that happens. Uh, anyway, but. But no, I, I don't know. So, But I'm still looking. It might have been, you know, I, I probably misremember it. But it's not surprising that I saw an episode of Babylon 5 where there are a bunch of allusions to, to Tolkien, Tolkien, right? No, that doesn't seem misplaced at all. No, but I'm trying to fit it into the the story, and I can't figure out exactly where, where it was. Where it fits or how. Anyway. Yeah. The movie's Next a mixed up. bag. Um, yeah. It's... Uh, they did a lot with low budget scenes. There's a lot of great indoor scenes where yeah, it's just it's very talky though. Yeah, it's very talky, and a lot of the drama in these scenes comes from the some dialogue. really good acting, good acting, and, and some really dramatic lighting. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, where like a character is suddenly revealed in a, a light. Dun, dun. You know, it's very theatrical in that right. way. Like you feel like you're in a black box theater. But then there are these big space battle things going on, but they didn't really have the budget to do all these space to do battle a big scenes. Star Wars explosion type. Yeah, right. No. So they keep having like space battle montages, and then someone's telling you, telling over telling the you action right. how this fits into the story. Right. Right. And it's and a little weak. It was engaging for the two oldest kids. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was not. Uh, there was not enough action for younger children. Right. So I think if you're a B five nerd. Yeah. Um, it's, you'll it's love imperative. Yeah. It's imperative. You've got to watch this. Yeah. Here, B5 Dirt. yeah. But if if not, it's enjoyable and it's worth watching. But it is kind of slow moving. It's kind of slow moving, and and I'll, really, it does it doesn't actually make a good pilot. That's true. Don't That's watch true. it first. Don't watch it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't watch it first. I, so. I, it's it's misleading to call it the pilot. Right. No, what's next? Okay. Moving on. Like, uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I want to mention that I got a boxed set that I ordered from an eBay seller, and yep. I really indulged myself by ordering 
a, a used, like a new old stock used box set pr- published by the Folio Society, which makes yeah. these very nice, Beautiful expensive editions. bound volumes. And of course, I got it much cheaper because it was old and just, right. like shop worn. Um, it is a five volume set of George Orwell's nonfiction books called Reportage. Now, mm-hmm. it is nowhere near a complete set of all his nonfiction work yeah. that takes like 15 volumes right. or more of he was prolific yeah he wrote newspaper columns articles all this right. these are just the books the nonfiction books that he published and finished as books as books okay right so um and the edition is a nice box although it was a little beat up in shipping unfortunately yeah. but the books themselves are in immaculate condition. condition which is yeah. like some some foxing they call it right right but they smell nice and they feel nice in the hand and they have photographs yeah, illustrated with photographs. Which and you weren't expecting. No. Yeah, that was and like pictorial wraps like on the, on the covers. Mm-hmm. Um, 20 years old. And you've been, you've actually been reading down <coughs> in Paris and London to the kids. Yeah. I started reading, uh, this is maybe not the absolute best choice of, um, children's literature bedtime story for the kids but i started reading down and out in paris and london because i read this book years and years ago when i was 19 or so and down and out in worcester ohio right yeah and remember it fondly and it's but you know i have to say reading this book to the children as a bedtime story yeah led to one of my favorite i have to say in my life favorite dinner time conversation faux pas oh really yeah which was Joshua asking me what a Protestant is. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, in, in the book, this centered around a scene where one of the characters recounts, which I actually had to censor while I was reading it, recounts a really horrifying story uh, of a visit to a, a brothel. To a brothel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I sort of skipped over and then had to explain what a, what what a, a prostitute was. Prostitute was. But and, we were at, at dinner talking about the Catholic, with the, with the dinner guest, talking about how he was raised Catholic and Grace was Catholic and all this. And that you're a Protestant. And then I'm a Protestant. Right. Uh, uh, and anyway, it goes. Then, then a few minutes later, Joshua comes back and he's like waiting for us to have a break in the conversation because he's got this pressing question as we're talking about Catholics and Protestants. Right. And he says, So, what is a Protestant? <laughs> And so I'm launching into this discussion of Martin Luther. We were talking and the about 95 theses and all the, and the, all that the and history of all the. And he's kind of like got his face screwed up. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, no. What? A protester? What's a protester? Like, oh, a those protester, people. Yeah. Like, they protest, you know, injustice, et cetera. You know, they, you know, they believe in something and it's not happening. And he's like, wait, no, 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 no. Um, you know, those women, they have sex for money. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you were like, oh, yeah, Protestants, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, do you mean a prostitute? Yeah, yes, that's what yes. he meant. And it was and so, like, <laughs> it, was it was like so really head scratching. Anyway. It was such a rich moment. And he's, and he's like, why do prostitutes exist? And so we had a nice frank conversation about that. But just that interlude of, what's a Protestant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you get gems like that yeah, from reading down and out in Paris. To your right, kids. right. Uh, but there's there's bits. Uh, so there's bits in, in French. Characters keep dropping into French. It's kind of right. gutter French. And I'm not, I can't really pick it out. So I translated the Rue de Coq d'Or as... The golden Chicken. As the Golden Chicken Street. <laughs> 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 and a, a more formal translation would probably call it the Street of the Golden... The Avenue of the Golden Rooster, rooster right? Yes. Know, so. Or, you know, knowing Orwell, he meant the golden cock. Yes, yes, yeah. So that's the thing. It's it's very funny. It's very funny and body. And it's... I remember some of that from reading it before, but we're reading it with much more life perspective. It's even funnier. It's really funny. Yeah. And especially if you read the dialogue of some of his characters out loud, they are fantastic characters. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't necessarily want to read... Um, his friends' anti-Semitic rants out loud, but they're you know because they're a little horrible and they don't have the context to understand this. But they're funny. They're funny, <laughs> you know. 
even though they're anti-Semitic. Yeah, I mean, so Orwell himself could be accused of anti-Semitism by quoting this well, character, you know, but you know, it's. I, I think <clears throat> it's. I think we do have the perspective that he was not um, a modern. Uh, no, some... not that he wasn't a modern. That even by his own time and standards, yeah, he, he wasn't exactly a hero. No. Okay. No. Do you? He w- and he was a journalist. You know, he was it's actually sure. a middle class guy who had a wealthy, relatively wealthy family, who put himself in this situation for the lulls. For <laughs> for the lulls, because he wanted to to write about these to write about this, this thing. Right. thing. And he needed the experience to have to do and, the writing, and yeah. literally did impoverish himself. He could have left. Yeah, you know, packed up, gone. But home. he stuck with it because he wanted to see the, you know, the, almost like disaster tourism of right. of these impoverished. Because the writing was so good. Because <laughs> the writing was so good, and you know, you may, I think, reasonable people can call out the sort of ethical problems in that. Yes. Right. Yes. But man, it's fun to read, and it really reminds me, in context of an early prototype of. A book like Kitchen Confidential. In other words, very much. I think a book like Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential was exists right. and is possible because of things like Down, Down and Out. Out in Paris and London. Anyway, mm-hmm. okay, that's another thing. We're still reading it, by the way. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see something about. I want to get back to the conquest of bread personally, but. Oh yeah. Oh, there's one more. Yeah, there's yeah. one more. That's uh, one. Another Thurber. Oh yeah, the, the wonderful O. The wonderful O. Yeah. And oh, here's my piece of paper. <laughs> Can't even find what I'm doing. Who am One, I? What's the wonderful happening? O by Thurber. Mm-hmm. And it's another fairy tale by Thurber. It's also full of verbal pyrotechnics and clever writing. Right. But all the gags and all that are about a group of pirates that invades this small peaceful island and they hate the letter O and they force everyone to stop using it. Right. So the book is largely just these litanies of all the things they can't say. They can't say. And convoluted. And how they return. Yeah, convoluted phrasings of, uh, you know, of all the words that have O in them, right? And right. it's just fun and to read. I, I remember <clears throat> that there's a, the kids have a, 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 like a Sesame Street cartoon where they do... Um, there's a very, very brief, like three minute cartoon that basically recounts the story, but it's the letter F. Oh yeah. You remember yeah. that? It's, oh, so and so hates the letter F, so she's gonna get rid of the letter F. It's like, oh no, the floor's leaving. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Somebody call a firefighter. <clears throat> Too late. <laughs> All of this, I think, goes back to a, a French novel in which the author decided to set himself the challenge of writing an entire full-length novel uh, without using the letter E. Bless his heart. And um, the result is fascinating and weird. Um, And probably comical. Yeah, but it turned into a whole, like, there's a whole name now. I forget the name, but I think it's named after this writer. Oh, right. uh, Of people who, like, write, deliberately setting themselves some, some technical ar- challenge right. like this, like removing a letter. Like an arbitrary technical <laughs> challenge. And here's here's my thing. The, people have translated the novel. <laughs> right? How does that work? If you can imagine setting yourself a technical challenge, imagine first writing a novel with missing a letter in French, and E is used an awful lot in French, I uh, should yeah. say. Um, and then... Trying to translate that into another language. And still have no E's? Uh, I think the translation wound up using no O's or something. I, I'd have to look it up, but man, I don't that's know. that's weird. It, it's weird, but yeah. I, th- I think the, the spirit of it was that uh, he removed the, the most commonly used letter. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the translator taking that same spirit to translate it into, I don't know, Norwegian or something. I don't even know. Removing the most, Remove common. the most commonly used letter in his language as well. Right. But the details elude me. If I can remember it quickly, I'll right. put it in the show notes. Anyway, anything uh, you have, I know uh, a pile of books you've been chipping away at. The only <clears throat> one I think I want to p- uh, bring up is Barracoon. Barracoon. Right, which is uh, Zora Neale Hurston's uh, most recent release. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's been given that she's been dead for some time. Some time. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of been buried in her notes for a long time, and mm-hmm. I think 
it um, it was neglected because a lot of it's written in dialect. Yeah. And that's yeah. People got issues about that. Like people don't want to print nigger anymore and Huck yeah. Finn. Yeah. And they got right. issues, right? Yeah. It's it's considered politically incorrect or at least or something. Or at least hard to deal with. I don't know. It's fascinating and heartbreaking. And what what the story is, is the story of uh the last um I think a person who came to the United States on the last slave ship from the west coast of Africa. Yeah. And and he was still alive in um, the early 20th century, yep. and she interviewed him at length, mm-hmm. and he wanted nothing to talk. He didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want to it talk took about her a long time. It took to him get a him long to time up. to uh, engage in a relationship with him and get him to talk about um, his life and what happened and what, what just what it was like, yeah. and give a first person account of this history. It's very good. I highly recommend it. Pick it up. Yeah, it's worth reading. I mean, I, I think it's it's. I would call it required reading for every American, but you know, I'm not really a fascist, so <laughs> I'm just yeah, going to so suggest you, you it don't strongly. Get, you don't get to impose to actually set the curriculum. Set the for curriculum, everyone. but yeah, but no, I, I think it's really um, it's it's valuable to every American to read this. It's a little perspective that it's actually different perspective than you get from reading the famous slave narratives. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because this man remembers life in a coastal village in Africa. Right, this this man was during, actually during yeah. the, the slave trade. Right, yeah. so like slave narratives are people who were born here, yes, and raised in American Channel slavery. Mm-hmm. This was a man who was captured and brought illegally. Yeah, during because the slave trade had been outlawed at this point. Yep. Um. So there was like so guy some guy had like chartered a ship. To go catch slaves in Africa and bring them to, to like to Louisiana mm-hmm. because he figured he could make a buck. Yeah, and uh, so he was, I think, nineteen. He was about to get married. He so yeah. he had yeah. vivid, full memories of his life. Uh, yeah, he wasn't like three when he was. He wasn't taken. three. No, he was yeah. he was a young adult. Yeah, and um, remembers, and he was a relatively high status in his community in his village. Yeah. In his village, and. Um, <clears throat> Remembers all this vividly and well, and has so has a a full story to tell, reflecting on what it was to to live in freedom and what it was to live as enslaved, yeah. and then to be liberated, such as it was, right. because there was really no liberation in the United States to speak of. Right. Um, it's a it's a great piece of piece of literature. It, it's cool. a real gift from from Hurston. Okay. All right. Anything so, else you want to mention? Are you baiting me? No. Okay. So, um, before we switch to our main topic. No, I think we're there. I think we're there. Yeah. Okay. So, you actually have a better memory than I do. And you are better able to remember dates and times and sequences of events. Oh, yeah. I My memory is a swamp of little details. Oh. And yeah. I often have time, have a hard time organizing things chronologically and I have to like look back at my notes to find out when things happen. Right. But I remember a lot of details that other people don't remember. Yeah, small. But but so but yeah. so why don't you small but, small but telling. So why don't you start why don't you like start the narrative? You were head up to uh I was to, head up to do this. To do this. C- kind of because I'm just so uh spent with like the end of this story. We kept waiting we kept putting it off because we've really been hoping that we can finish the story or at least close the chapter. Right. And the, the close of the chapter was going to be, we finally sold our house. Right. And then we, you know, and that big connection where we're still, where we still have all this responsibility and stuff going on up in Saginaw was done and was then that, if we just, went back we could just go back to visit people or to or yeah for the fourth of july or whatever yeah 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 and, and also just so we felt like it would be good closure for the show that be we good did. closure yeah. like we do so we you know right. we don't tell this unfinished story right but and we thought actually that this was coming up yeah and we were about to sell the house and it would we'd be closing about this week yeah 
but um, it Alas, has no. fell apart, fallen apart. Alas, it fell apart. So, so hell with it. Let's tell the story now. Let's tell the story, and the f- the end is yet unwritten. Yeah. So in 2010, the day before my uh, birthday, 2010, we drove up to Saginaw mm-hmm. and looked at a house. <laughs> I, I'd seen it on the web, and it was like. Seriously? Comically large. Comically large and comically cheap. Right. That that's the real our our perspective was very skewed by having been around Ann Arbor for a long time. Right, right. <clears throat> and we just couldn't like so what's the so what's the catch? I mean and, yeah. and the catch really and only. There's only what there was only ever one catch. Right. The catch is that it was in Saginaw. That's right. the catch. Location. Location. And so um and we like, you know, looked around and like, okay, so it's in Saginaw. Yeah. You know, whatever. Um, and we ended up buying the house um, and we had this sort of phased in move in. Yes. Where you moved in like May 1st. In order to buy the house, I had to arrange permission to work from home. Right. Because uh, I was working uh, for a company in Lansing at their Ann Arbor location. Right. There were some other remote employees around the state in small offices. There was a little group in Frankenmuth. There was mm-hmm. a group in on the west side. Um, right. But um, I was basically proposing that I, having worked there for three years plus, I was proposing yeah. that I become basically a division of one. Yeah. You know, yeah. While I think at, at least sa- one other person had done that in the past or something like yeah. that. Yeah. While at the same time saying, you know, if you ever need me at a meeting in Lansing, I'll come down. Wherever, I'll come. It's yeah. a long drive, but it's not, you know. Un- Impossible. No, certainly not. So I got that permission. So, and there were a couple of like sort of caveats, you know. We, so we played last the asking prize and we're thinking a couple of things. Yeah. That A, the asking prize was low enough to absorb any further deterioration in the market yeah be right because this was this was just after it was shortly after the the 2008 crash, crash. it was a couple of years later we figured you know how much lower price is going to go i don't know but <laughs> let's find out yeah um and um and so your telecommute job was the job that you had and we were just going to move with you and you know it's 2010 there's probably other telecommuting work. You would think. You would think. And um, what else was there? Oh, and even if there wasn't, oh, this was the biggest sort of like uh, naivety, mm-hmm. at, at least in retrospect. Mm-hmm. So even if there wasn't other telecommute work, that between the both of us working, <laughs> we yeah. could con- carry on. We con- could continue on. We could find, uh, I could find something. So the our mortgage payment on this this thing so the the buyer originally wanted 128 or i'm sorry 150, 150 right and that had probably been knocked down over the years right because yeah, the house been, been on, on the market for some time like five years off and on right? yeah and she was uh, a retired woman a, a, a widow retired widow yeah and she and her son were living in the house and it was mm-hmm. way too much house for them to manage yeah but um so we were thinking, wow, that even 150, that doesn't seem bad. But Grace was full of caution about how, well, it's it's really not, you know, you got to think about what we might be able to sell it for and what we might be able to earn. And we All also the were thinking about, okay, well, software jobs sometimes come and go. Companies, True. consulting companies, development teams go out of business. I've lost jobs, right? right so. Happened. Um, <clears throat> this one seemed pretty stable and pretty promising, but uh, electronics was never really doing well, yeah, right? Yeah. And because they were never really doing well, no one mm-hmm. got a raise for seven years. Years and years and years. And, years. <laughs> and yet I was still there because <laughs> uh, it's hard to find a new job and it's a yeah. big traumatic upheaval. Right. But um, but yeah, you were say- you were we were just saying okay. Let's figure out what you would be taking home on unemployment. And make sure we can cover the mortgage payment. And make sure that would be enough to cover the mortgage payment. And it, and it, and it was. Yep. Our mortgage payment was only 900 something. Yeah. Which seems laughably small. Yeah. But it was less than what we were paying in rent. It was less than what we were paying in rent. Right. For like three times the house. Yeah. So, yeah. 
And I also had some cash mm -hmm. because I inherited some money from my mom when she passed away right. in 2007. Right. So I had some cash. I had actually some of it was in stock, which mm -hmm. I could sell. Right. So, so anyway, we so decided we to go house. for it. We decided to go for it. We bought the house. And um, <clears throat> don't fall in love with the house. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. Th that was, I think, a big mistake. It was not the right house for us. Yeah, because uh, actually, in retrospect, we could have um, bought a smaller or just a different house. Yeah. In Saginaw. Right. And had a different experience, you know? Yeah, the experience could have been much different. Right. We still might be having trouble selling it. Oh, now. Yeah, yeah. But um, we could have spent less and we could have we could got have a place less. that was more modern better insulated and that would have changed our experience, our experience a lot there. yeah yeah so. um so I, I think so we did the stage move in may and then i came in june and then isaac came in july yeah something like that because i think isaac had to stay for an internship i i moved up there to take possession because of the timing of the the sale right and we get and like i think she was gonna give, give us possession like 30 days after the closing or something like yeah. that and then the um um, and I, I needed to set up my home office. Oh, and I had to clean out the old apartment. Yeah. So <clears throat> there was a lot to do. So we did. Oh my goodness. There was a lot to do. Lot it to was do. trip after trip, trip back after and trip. forth. It was yeah. really hard. Very, I, I, very I, hard. Very stressful time. We I remember were, my we brother Jim exhausted. said to me after after we moved, right yeah. after the getting there, he said, "Wow, that was a hard move." And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "You've looked twenty five for the last fifteen years." Mm -hmm. you look your age now <laughs> <laughs> you've caught like, up with it, you. you've like it's all caught up with you like in the last month it, it really did it was yeah. it was very difficult and i couldn't help all that much because i still needed to you be did, working you'd be at your desk at work every day yeah yeah working 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 yeah business and yeah yeah so that was um so that was hard but we had this idea Mm -hmm. And the idea was that we would start a Catholic worker house. Yeah. And we would take in um, families. Right. The house was so big, we it should say. It was enormous. Yeah. 3,600 square feet. Yep. And one of the reasons that I was instantly attracted to it and wanted to buy that house mm -hmm. was because there was a suite built in to the th to upper floor on one right. side, which had was sort of half attic. Yeah. It wasn't, there was an attic above it, but it was high up. Right. It was elevated a bit. Um, there was a a bathroom, a two little office, office rooms, rooms. Yeah. adjacent to each like other. Like a little bedroom suite. Like a little suite. So like you have your bedroom in one room, and then yeah. there's like a sitting area, right. and there's a bathroom. I turned that a into a closets. home office and recording studio. Yeah, and it was all wood paneled. It was a very masculine space. And I we had the floors refinished, so it was all yeah. polished wood. It was really beautiful and lovely. Yeah. Uh, and this, it being like, it was literally as far away from the family room as it was possible to be in the it's, house. still be in the house. So and you so could work. I, I could go in there and basically lock myself in. Right. Lock the kids out. Right. And... I had a separate phone line. I had a separate internet connection. I had like everything. I got wired in there when we moved in. Yep. I got electricians in to put in networking updated so I could yeah. set up all. Yeah. The we updated the electrical so I could put in all my build all server can. and computers. Right. I had a whole development studio studio there. Um, but the insulation in the house was terrible, ancient, yeah. and dilapidated, and. This room, they were built with wood paneling and these drawers and cabinets that were open into the crawl space inside the shell of the house. Were freezing in the winter and, and sweltering in the summer. It was so uncomfortable. Yeah. It was... There was like two months out of the year it was nice. It was bearable. Yeah. In the winter, we'd have the... Um, the thermostat set to 63 and it would actually be in the 40s. In, in some of the extreme areas of the house. In yeah. some of the... In that room i would be working with layers on and fingerless gloves and trying to type and work and my nose would dripping. actually be dripping onto my keyboard you yeah. know yeah and then in the and summer it was, it was 63 because the heat was 900 dollars, 800 dollars, over 800 without to heat the house heat in the, the winter house. months to 63 to to get it up to 63 yeah and because it was this big stone <clears throat> behemoth drafty and 
poorly weather stripped and insulated Mm -hmm. and we never really got that fixed no no well it was always this sort of like whack-a-mole yeah so what do we do next i don't know what do we do next and so there was the windows there was the insulation there was summer months i'd be in there sitting literally in my underpants you know yeah dripping Dripping sweat sweat. with a fan on in the winter dripping snot from your nose (laughs) So, so no matter what happened, you could you were just dripping. <laughs> it was so uncomfortable. So uh, yeah. And the my manager at the time was kind of hostile to the fact that I was working from home because he was sort of I think overridden by his manager who gave me permission to do this. Right. But he his reaction was, well, screw it. He's on vacation. I'm not going to communicate with him anymore. There you go. And so I would beg to be on projects. I would beg to be invited to meetings. I would beg to attend meetings. I would sometimes just drive down there and drop in just to see up. people. And I would find out that they were having meetings without things me. Were things right. were going on. Right. right. And I was being excluded from them. Like actively. And given this busy work or very low status, low interest stuff to work on. Right. And I didn't have enough to do. But yet, because of my like um, work ethic... Mm-hmm. And fearing that they would sort of like think that I was slacking, I was still in that office eight hours every day, you know, right. like waiting by the phone, waiting for emails, waiting for anything, and doing some development work that largely I just sort of picked up on my own mm-hmm. and like was rewriting and improving things. Just figure it out. But right. I wasn't, uh, he just sort of refused to keep me in the loop. Right. And it was maddening and very depressing and my mental health was really suffering suffering a lot yeah the um so the idea was we would have a because we had all this space there were basically right. it was too three, big for a family three living areas in the house yeah it's a huge like house. three you really could fit three families very comfortably in that house together or a huge extended family yes with su- multiple generations <laughs> right and because um and really like if <clears throat> even if they didn't like each other i think the only conflict would be using those stairs because right. there was like this right. one corridor that you had to go through. Right. But honestly, aside from that, you didn't have to talk to each other, hang out. <laughs> there's you a go big, to your co- yeah. Yeah, there's a big master bedroom suite upstairs with its right. own bathroom. Its own bathroom, its own fireplace. Shower, like fireplace. Like a little wing of its own. And, and if you close off that whole suite, it's like two bedrooms. Yes. A bathroom, shower. Yeah. Another and bedroom fireplace. in the middle, a bunch right. of walk-in bunch of closets, closets and all and that. Like, our family could have lived in those two rooms alone. Yeah, really. Comfortably. Um, um, and then yeah. there was your office suite. Which would, it would actually be a great suite for a teenager to live. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I think, well, no, 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 I don't think we gave, I, I think you chose that first. Yeah, that's where and I needed to be, unfortunately. For, for work. And then there was, an, like, another two bedrooms yeah. and, a dedi- and a bath dedicated to those two bedrooms where still more people would be comfortable and our idea was to uh, downstairs. have downstairs downstairs yeah. to have that space for guest space and yeah. etc um and then we, we haven't even talked about the the family room right the room we used as our library and then the kitchen right. kitchen was awkward it was poor awkwardly laid out frustrating Aw- I can, endlessly was, frustrating endlessly frustrating in the kitchen it was huge Weirdly angled walls. And it was really this poor, enormous kitchen. Really poor use of space. And it was so poorly laid out, people kept crashing into each other to use this right. enormous kitchen. The stove was right next to the door into the family room, and there was this narrow space there with the fridge with across the fridge. From it, which was literally the bottleneck, because when you were working in there, right. everyone was constantly coming in and out of coming the family and room, and you needed to be right there. It was just right this there weird the stove, bottleneck. And God forbid someone had to open the fridge. Yeah, and this was all, it's not what the house was originally laid out. No, no, this was like a 70s fuck up. And they put in a weird angled wall that wasn't there originally. They cut through. There it was. It's like someone said, hey, let's put this wall at a 20 degree angle. Wouldn't that be be fun? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, which was really the only sort of like uh, uh, bastards or bottlerization of a really, really great 2019, you know, Art Deco. Great bones. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, great bones in the house. Um, and um, a very comfortable sort of away from it all library. And then this enormous 20 by 30, 600 square foot yeah, family room. The fam- it was 900 square foot. Was it really? I think so. Well, no, the, like the, the addition was 900 square feet because the okay. family room plus the, the master bedroom above okay. all right. was like about the same size. That was what was like, I think this is what like sucked me in 
after being in our townhouse for so long? Oh, yeah, we were kind of we were really spoiled kind of for. We were, we were really itching for space, and so it makes sense that we jumped for this thing that had all this space. All this space. Because we really had been cramped. Kind of cramped and hemmed in. So the family room and the master bedroom suite, which were in addition to the original house, yeah. were about the same size as our townhouse that we were moving from. Right, right. So one, yeah, one like... Wing of the house. One part of the house, the, the, the family room was about the size of the first floor of our whole apartment. Yeah. Right, yeah. so really, it's quite stunning. It was the size, the space was the size of a small restaurant or cafe. Absolutely, right. no question. With larger a, than some I've been in. Larger than some restaurants and cafes. Yeah, right. Just that one room. Yeah. And with this huge, massive fireplace and a bay window with a yeah. lovely little built-in seat. Light windows on three sides. Yep. And, um, and we when we moved in, we. Well, that's a whole side quest adventure about the carpeting and all that. Oh, uh, so to, to to go through it quickly, which really elides like months of trauma, right? right and thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, we found that uh, the white carpet, gold, seventies gold, in the it was white in the family room. I, oh, that was white in in the it was white in the library, and we kept that for a long time. Yeah, it was gold in the family room. Are you sure? Because I have positive. video. Yeah. Oh, bring the video. Okay, but we'll I, have that to go was for gold that. carpet. Anyway, anyway um, we <laughs> had to. Uh, so we, it's obviously it's already like fading from our memories, but um, that we wasn't there there very long. So right, um, we had to tear that up because the owner had like incontinent pets. Yeah, and I remember walking through thinking, hmm, it "Smells like cats." We'll have to rip that carpet out. Yeah, and not thinking about it again. Like right. not it didn't like that seem was a that bad. Right. It didn't seem that bad. When we dug into it, we found it that, was that bad. That uh, like generations of incompetent, 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 incontinent pets had ruined the carpet, the pad underneath, underneath the carpet, the subfloor, the subfloor and even down into the, the rafters, rafters the rafters themselves, and the walls, the walls, and and for the bonus, yeah. Layer of asbestos insulation. Oh right, yeah. That the the tile there there was a layer of tile floor underneath the carpet pad that had to come out, and it mm-hmm. was loaded with asbestos. Yes. And so this flooring project, which was supposed to be like, oh, we'll rip the carpet out <clears throat> and see the hardwood underneath. And we, yeah, right. We there was won, no hardwood. There was no hardwood. There's just this particle board and then soaked. it was soaked with urine everything soaked stank, all the way through with urine reeks it was still damp like yeah. months after we moved in from urine right <laughs> like it was it's it was like horrible. literally unbelievable it was horrible like he would tell us and he'd be like are we you making this up and the flooring guy would and keep... he'd like just look <laughs> and finally we ex- excavate so much of the room that we were wa- we were like standing over the the crawl space and we could yes. see it we could see, see it down straight into through. it right yeah. um but our flooring guy charlie he he was he soldiered on i mean we paid him a he lot of money <laughs> yeah but but you know at one he, point he was in a space suit <clears throat> right he, he had to hire another guy to come in and and like they had to tent up the, the room, room with plastic and do the positive pressure thing to remove the asbestos and wear masks and and like hazmat suits and the all that. It was yards. it was astounding. Yeah. And but they finally got we we had bought this flooring from Chelsea Hardwood Flooring, this oak flooring, and we got it all installed and it looked beautiful. It's fantastic. Yeah. It was really just breathtaking. And that that made the room breathtaking. So we we invested. Money, money, a lot of money, money and more house. than we planned to into in this house. house. Because, again, back to the idea, we were going to welcome, do hospitality for right. families that were right. in need, right. and we wanted to um, have that huge room. We wanted to make it available to the community for salons, for learning, for all kinds concerts. of concerts. I wanted concerts. to have concerts there. All kinds of things like that. Yeah. And, well, we tried, and we were successful to a point in some ways yeah um the thing that kept it i mean we did have salons we had the breakfast club that met every friday you started big be, being super extrovert grace and reaching out and forming groups and clubs and and getting and just connecting and you had contacts like, and friends right and and we started doing all those all that stuff 
mm-hmm. and it was kind of we had people coming to our house to visit and meet with us every week yeah really regularly and it was kind of humming along yeah and it was kind of working and to be perfectly honest a lot of the seeds we planted have only now just started to bear fruit we did we made a lot of contacts we met a lot of people and like hooked a lot of people together and hooked a lot of people together who were thinking some of the same, same who, things and then even ran like some some seminars right yeah and some really great seminars got involved in planning some some local events this is what grace does like when she yeah. has free time she is a natural community organizer, right? right? It's just what I do. And so, like, seminars and meetings sprout up, and, you know, just people are filming things, and we're getting on the news and in the paper and all this. That just happens, because that's who she is, you right. know? So, so we did that, and it was kind of humming along. But then, like, the reality of what it means to be this deindustrialized town, yeah, and to just sort of quickly set the backdrop yeah saginaw is a town that at one point had gm employing fifty thousand people yes that same plant now employs five thousand people right so, so the 40, population right. went from uh, from over 100, like one hundred ten thousand down to down to 50 roughly. actually i think it's less than 50 and Na- i think they fudge it's... the numbers whenever they can maybe because there's a huge like the fifty is the fifty thousand people, is a magic number because there's federal funding you get as a urban oh, I see. area. <laughs> I see. Um, so I, I don't. We don't I, know. Yeah. We don't know that the exact the official numbers are accurate. But it's and around. It's, 50, it's only 000. a census every ten years, right? Too, so right. A, yeah, roughly around fifty thousand people live in Saginaw now. But the the point is that that the infrastructure of the city all existed and was built up over over many decades right. to support a population of oh, over 100,000 people. Well, like over a century. Yeah. And so supported a city of 100,000 people. And with those 45,000 jobs, all the things those people bought right. left the city too. And it wasn't just uh, GM though. I mean, before that had been a lumber town, before that yeah. had been this and that and the other right. thing. You At know. one point... Um, uh, m- almost all the beans, almost all the great northern mm-hmm, beans mm-hmm. on the planet came through Saginaw, Michigan. Yeah, they were. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's an extremely fertile <clears throat> river delta. Yeah. So don't let don't get me off into um, geographic and <laughs> no dioxin and ge- geographic determinism about what a city yeah. how cities formed. Yeah. Anyway, that's the quick sketch of like what has happened to Saginaw since the 1970s. Um, this loss of all these jobs and all the attendant things that go with it. Um, so Saginaw started to happen as we're kind of cooking along. Yeah. Literally one by one. We, we moved there in part seeing signs of life. Yes. And hoping to be part of that. Be part of that. Be part and of And be there right. as it started to to improve and grow and, and people started doing organizing and development right. at, on a local small scale human scale distributed you know among small businesses and individuals right and we saw a little of it we saw a little of it um people started dying yeah leaving the the, the people who are the the working class democratic long labor organizing history activists mm-hmm. are elderly are elderly but they would either die some of them were killed um move away yeah change jobs and no longer able to function in their their capacity in the city anymore right a lot and of people, so on. a lot of people moved away a lot of people people so, we got to know and have, as we have a lot of so like our, with, our like our salon all the that core circle <clears throat> everyone left People kept leaving yeah. to the point where everyone was gone. And you mentioned people dying, but I, I, I have to call out two particular two particulars, events. Yeah. One was that I gradually started to do things like I would take my laptop and walk down to downtown. Because we were the, walking distance to downtown. To the Red Eye Cafe and sit mm-hmm. up there and like do some of my work there yeah. in a cafe. I only did this a, a few times. Right, and I, I'm not very outgoing. I'm, it's hard for me to meet people and make friends. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I met a guy named Sean Stennett, who was a barista at the Red Eye, and I was looking also for people to collaborate with on music. So I was doing a lot of songwriting right. and recording songs. I was looking for people to collaborate with, and the cafe like that is like 
if there's a bohemian spot in Saginaw, that would be that was the red eye. Yeah, yeah. people it still is the red eye. Yeah, still people put eye. up there like drummer wanted, you know, whatever all their organized right. bands they do community things. Right. Um, and got to know Sean because as a barista, he was like one of these highly connected people, right? And very friendly, and I liked him, and and was hoping to meet people via yeah. him, right? Which is why I was pretty demoralized and devastated when he was murdered. Yeah. Right. Shot through his front door. Someone, in a case of mistaken identity, some kind of drunken violence or whatnot, like yeah. shot right through. Didn't He didn't open the door. They, they shot the bullets the right through his door and killed him. Thinking he was someone else. Thinking he was someone else. They were in the wrong apartment. Yeah. Um, that was one. Yeah. And then the other was when just a mile or so from our house, mm-hmm. uh, a mentally ill black man named Milton Hall is waving a plastic knife, uh, was uh, summarily executed by a firing squad of police officers yeah. who were too impatient and fed up with him to. Uh, wait a little bit longer until they could get some non-lethal uh, restraints and weapons there. And they all lined up and just shot him simultaneously shots. so that none of them would be personally culpable for his death. Yeah. And that kind of soured me, honestly. Takes all the wind out of your sails. On Saginaw in many ways. Yeah. Um, I did make personal sort of contact with the guy that ran the local used record store. Oh, you yeah, Bob. Bob's and, a good guy. Uh, I bought so many used CDs for Dirt Cheap, and he got to know my tastes. And when I would show up, he would say, hey, I, I, got I set aside some things for you. And he'd pull out a <laughs> box. 75 CDs. And I'm like, wow, okay. Really? And I'd buy some of them. And then right. sometimes he'd say, oh, yeah, these are a bunch of uh, like things that I thought you might be interested in. They're all like promotional and whatnot. You can just, just have them. Em. Yeah, just take them. And like, here's a box, like one, like 100 or more promotional discs yes, right I'm like wow and okay. you know i mean i used to work in a college radio station right i'm really familiar with this stuff and so mm-hmm. like i'd loved to pour through it's it and this, find yeah. the occasional song i'd never heard of the band i'd never heard of the good song. a lot of it's garbage but you know yeah. it's fun to me to go through this stuff and right. he knew that and i'd go back and talk about Oh yeah, this weird French Canadian band that was in there. This weird some other act or whatnot, right. etc. And, and he's still there. Yeah, he's still there. So at least like a chop is still there. At least if if, <laughs> but but I don't know. They're not you know the yeah. record stores are on are not doing not that on the upswing. Well. Not on the upswing. Right. Um, and so a lot of this stuff started to collapse and lose momentum as people kept leaving. Yeah, our friends the uh, the Mitlings especially. Yeah, well, they left. They finally left around the time we left, like twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen. Yeah, but and, the writing was on the wall, and they yeah. were doing. A, they were into the urban farming. Urban thing. farming. They had they had a double lot, and um, <coughs> were one of the charter members of uh, our um, Saginaw Harvest Growers Cooperative, and which allowed allowed us to rent a table at the farmers, farmers market. market. That people were yeah. using to uh, to sell things that they were growing, like on our block. On our block, right? So you know, like hyper local agriculture. Yeah. And and it was kind of cooking along, but I again another elderly member died. Yeah. His children didn't want to take over. Right. Um, the Midlings kind of you know ended up moving out of town. That's right. right. They moved out of town first before right. they actually left the whole area. Right. And um, uh, another member moved to Midland. Closer yeah. to work. That's forty five minutes That's away. Forty five minutes away. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not intractable to go visit, but as far as like being in the community, in the it's, community it's, it's, it's just doesn't work. Doesn't work. It's over. So that kind of attrition, it was really hard to keep momentum going. Yeah. And really hard to get people to come back. And then there were a number of people who were enthusiastic but marginalized such that they couldn't be consistent. Yeah. That, um, things were tough all over. Things were tough say. all over. Yeah. Um but at the same time, 
Right. At the same time, all these sort of like um, new initiatives and things didn't really. Well, they took off and then floundered. Yeah. Um, other things like they they ended up feeding and nourishing other things. Um, just this week, the marketplace and farmers market opened the farmer's market opened in a permanent location with it's, it's sort of like it had been uh, rented tents on a vacant lot yeah it's now a built-out space with it's a permanent location and it's is it year-round now and it is now year-round because they have an indoor facility alongside it yeah just like the flint farmer's market right which if you if you know anything about theory at all i mean you can see the flint farmer's market online it's 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 really nice. It's really nice. It's not what you expect if you have this view of Flint. No, you no. Know, it, I mean, I would challenge you to find a farmer's market this nice in San Francisco. Yeah. It, it's marvelous. Yeah. And, um, you know, the building's old and a little dilapidated and whatnot. But, uh, but although I think that was part of its charm, like they redid right. an old building. Right. Right. But it's, uh, but it's, it's terrific. And you can yeah. find the most amazing produce there. Year round. Yeah. And now and now Saginaw has one. It just uh, the doors on the on the permanent the year round facility opened just this Friday. Yeah. Or probably so, this Wednesday. So things are maybe showing some signs of showing life. Showing some signs of life. The old theater, the old yeah. dollar theater was closed, renovated, it's now open doing art films right. and things like that. Right. So that's um, where I, I took the kids to see the Lego movie. Right. 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 And, and it's then a great they finally theater. closed. I mean it, it's a pretty it was kind of a dilapidated place that it's needed kind of dilapidated renovation and, you know but, it was doing like the second third run movies yeah but it's been renovated yeah. and it's been you know it, it's experiencing a resurgence every town needs a, a second run theater every time or a, a a place where movies can be exist that aren't the can, blockbusters, blockbusters you know because yeah. there's so there's so much more than the block to film than the big, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or right? Whatnot, so, um, and uh, so some of these things are seeing fruition, and it's it's hard sometimes to really. I don't think we have quite enough hindsight to fully know where we went wrong. No, I'm, we're getting there, maybe. But um, because what eventually happened is pe- people kept leaving. Things kind of got derailed. Yep. In 2013, you lost your job. I lost my job. They finally, and you know, it wasn't even anything particularly personal about my relationship with this manager. No. It was because they finally gave up on their software projects. Oh, right. Because right. they weren't making money on it, and the company was doing more Electronics always had two sides. It was like right. an assembly house for for electronics and um, a software, a custom software team. Right. And they kept trying to build up the software team. They worked on some high profile projects, including mm-hmm. like post nine eleven stuff for police vehicles and yeah. uh, and first responders and all that. Mm-hmm. Even like motorcycle cops. They did yeah. RV systems and all this, mm-hmm. and it was pretty good. You know, like millions yeah. of lines of code. And, but um, they just couldn't, like, compete with bigger contracting companies. Right. And they gave up on that. So they basically laid off the last of their software engineers. Software engineers, right. Yeah. And that, as I say, was that. And so we were suddenly, because I wasn't in close, like, regular contact with my managers, because that's not how it was going. Right. Um, despite it my efforts, it actually, I, I, I wouldn't have been shocked if I had been laid off after a year, right? right? But like two years later, <laughs> when I'm, you know, uh, things are still puttering along at a kind right. of a low grade level to hear, well, sorry, Paul, but, uh, this is the end. Yeah. There you go. And, uh, it was a bit of a shock and we were in deep trouble quickly. Yes. And that's when we found out that there was lead in the house. Right. This all came, was it the same year? It was all the same year. That was when our big boy lost his mind and moved out. Yeah, we, we determined uh, that that our uh, there was lead in the house because the kid's pediatrician said, why don't you have him tested for lead? It's just a routine thing I like to As do a, for, yeah, it was for totally kids routine. that live in this 
city. Actually, you know? all his patients. He tests all his, all his patients. patients for lead. Okay. And um, so we did. And like initially didn't hear anything or didn't get right. anything back. And then like the, the the boom came like, oh, by the way. Yeah. And it wasn't a shockingly high level no, of lead. No, it wasn't like you know, really high. But, but it was enough to warn us that the kids have been exposed to, to environmental lead, lead. Right. And what's really frustrating about that is it probably wasn't even from the paint in the house. Right. We had gotten this ping pong table. Because we needed a huge table. We needed a big dining table. Someone was getting rid of a ping pong table, and we brought it in, mm-hmm. and we started using it as our dining table. Right. And the kids had their hands on it all the all time. All the time. And Along with food. They, they would eat sometimes right, right off the, the table. table. Right. And that table was... Tested positive for lead. It was painted with lead paint. Which I have to say, I asked specifically about before I bought it. You asked specifically about it before you bought it. It was quite yeah. old. It had been in someone's basement. It was painted with lead paint. Yeah. If he didn't know... He didn't know. He, he should have said, I, I don't, don't know. know. But he just lied. And just lied. Right? This is sort of one of the... I have to... You know, a brief, brief aside... Yeah. People in a situation like this in a collapsing town where the people who are smart and talented and have prospects for their lives probably have moved away left, unless yeah. they're stuck due to family obligations or something for like some that. Reason, right? um, leaving behind people who are not so bright, not or, or, so honest, not so diligent, not so... Well, not that... Being Anything. bright is necessarily connected to virtue, but rather, these are the people who are desperate. And people and who are desperate corners. will just lie to you about everything. Well, and cut, and cut corners that they, even that individual might not have cut uh, ten in, years earlier. Ten years earlier in different situations. So our the person who sold us the house was not forthcoming with many things. This no, individual let's just was not let's just say that things. she hid a lot of critical flaws critical and information. Flaws. That, that, that even had we, we known, were, had we known, even in love we, with the house, even in love with the house, we would not have bought the house. Right? Had we known, and um, having owned the house for ha, her family, yeah. having owned the house for forty years, forty years, yeah, we believe we she sure they knew. knew they that there was a lot of lead in the paint, right? Yeah, right. The, and there was like specific. They found lead in specific places, right? And did specific, re- and that was this was sort of the silver lining, because you were unemployed and your income was so low. Right. We were at the state, did all the lead remediation. That was, that was like a, a lead lining though, because they came in. We had to move into a hotel for a week, and I t- had to work from home oh, from, from a, a hotel, hotel Wi-Fi, for a week. For a week. While and I had to get the kids out of the hotel room to. Yeah. Work. Uh, and. <laughs> Yeah, and they did. They we thought they were actually gonna remove paint, strip paint, strip and repaint paint and, and repaint. whatnot. They and in fact, it they did this really shitty job where they just slopped this white encapsulation paint all over everything. They dripped it all down the the side of the house. It was really they dripped it all down awful. the the door frames and whatnot. They were working as quickly as possible. Contractors yeah. paid by the state or whatnot, minimum low bidders or all that and all that. And then they were done. They're like, okay, it's all safe now. We're like, what the? Thanks. I mean, and frankly, since I was, I moved on with my life because I was confident that the specific lead exposure was out of the house. We thought that it might be in the house paint. So we had this this thorough testing done. This very thorough testing done. And the problem is that once we got that result, that now, result is now an albatross around our neck because legally we are requir- required, required to, to disclose. D- disclose all the information we have about lead paint in the house. Right. And lead paint we, that we'd found in the house. And the house. it wasn't even likely the source of the kids' of lead the kid contamination. Right. So there was that little gambit. and um, so We didn't know about the, the table until this whole process this was whole process underway and we right. had the paint testing done. Right. Like, and it was really an aside. The guy was in the house. He said, Is there, do you have anything you want me to take a look at while I'm here? I said, just test, test this table. Yeah. So we did. And that was, like we said, most likely the source the of the source. kid's blood levels. Anyway. So, uh, it, but it's possible that that much exposure 
did mess with their behavior. You know. Oh yeah, damaged. Yeah, yeah, was actually damaging. Right. Um, and mind and you, so we feel this is incredibly well, guilty and stupid. And right? stupid, right? It's a lot of guilt and what if and. But mind you, their exposure, which is now recognized as being significant, yeah. was well under the That's, threshold that would flag anybody, say, even twenty years ago. Right. Right. So now um, they keep they keep lowering. So the, oh, by the way, actually. You know, maybe actually any exposure is because dangerous. Because they find out right. pretty much anything above like this sort of common baseline level is is indicates possible possible damage. damage. So, so that happened, and um, it was you, you had some temp jobs, but it yeah, was, from that point on, I I struggled and struggled to find work. Right, and and mind you, we made a decision. In 2013, yeah. when you lost your telecommute permanent job, yeah, that we were going to try and stay. We were going to try and stick it out. We were going to try and stick it out. that Because it had been three years, and we'd seen how things kept getting started. It was almost like I'd poked a hornet's nest. Right. And right. things just started to like, oh, yeah, coalesce buzz around, around. Buzz around and start yeah. to happen. And we'd seen what attrition did to it and yeah. felt like, you know, we, we can't just leave. Well, that, this was the thing, talk about guilt, is I knew that that road out of Saginaw was really well-worn. Wow. And just for moral and ethical reasons, I really did not want our family to be just tromping that road with everyone else and right. abandoning everything. Right. Um, but the process of trying to find work was, was awful. And we gave it two years. And yeah, and I finally did get a contract gig that where I could do most of my work from home, but still had to uh, travel to commute some of the time to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yeah, which is a hell of a drive. Yeah, um, but I'd stay overnight for a few days. Well, yeah, you would stay over yeah, and, and go and, to a bookstore. And that actually okay. So that that job was. Two I felt years I felt pretty good about it because I found critical bugs in. Uh, the code for a medical device. Yes. Right. And fixed and, you know, right. Got them fixed. That was a software testing job and it was software testing that required writing a lot of code to test code. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing is the documentation requirements and the sort of scaffolding for that sort of work mm -hmm. made it incredibly tedious and i was it like you say you said incredibly tedious already but it's mm -hmm. hard to even convey how many thousands, thousands of pages of tests and tedium that i w did in like the year that i had that job right and i was you know c contracted i was a contractor of a contractor of a contractor it was absurd. It was absurd. I was working for a company based in georgia that was contracting for a company in, in Chicago? In Chicago that was contracting for a company in... Indiana. Indiana that was contracting for another company in Indiana. Okay. Something like that. And um, that I thought that since I had done good work, and I actually I kept getting calls from the project manager who's like, don't be discouraged. You've found more bugs on this project than all the rest of the developers. Combined. <laughs> he didn't... See did he say that? I, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, like, it was a stupefyingly boring job. Right. But right. with the aid of, like, large amounts of caffeine, I was able to push through and make some progress on it. And I think dur it was during this time yeah. that you started walking ritualistically. Like, every morning. Every morning. Rain or shine. Yeah, I right, think how so. How about the weather? You started walking. You were, And I think it was actually a little bit before, like, your last... Um, I don't remember. Six it was like your last six months of electronics, and then through this period while you were still in Saginaw, yeah, you were walking every day. I think it started when I was unemployed, but I was walking every day, and I carried an audio recorder with me. And you'd talk out, whatever. and I'd talk yeah. out whatever I was thinking. Right. And during this time, I recorded hundreds of hours of audio. <laughs> yeah. And I walked. Well over a thousand miles. Oh, easily. I wore out. I figured it out at one point, roughly. Right. I would walk laps of our street. Right. And which was like a half mile one way. Yeah, 
and so I figured it all out at one point. Um, but it was, um, I would walk between two and a half and six. And six miles. Sometimes as much as six, as little as two and a half if you were in a hurry. Six miles every yeah. day. Yeah. And this was really the only thing that was holding my morale and my sanity, I think, together. Together. It was, was being able to do this every morning and then before I had to get back to this tedium. Um, the... Uh, I thought that because I had been uh, kind of a good performer on this project that the contracting, subcontracting, sub subcontracting company, Might when this project thing. ended, they would find something else for me to do. But they just laid everyone off. Nah. Boom. And this is how a lot of this employment works now is for all intents and purposes, I'm a I'm a 1099 employee. Well, you're a 10, but it's, it's not even like. But they but they don't hire people that way because of the the tax issues. Right. So they they make people W two employees and they just hire and fire them with no ceremony whatsoever. Whatsoever. Nothing. Right. And it's almost like you're a widget. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. So. It's, that was they call it a body shop. A body shop. Yeah, where you're just a body to fill a seat. Fill a seat. And a project needs a certain number of bodies to be finished. So here you are. Right. And that was really like a, a, a circle of hell, was yeah. collecting unemployment from that situation. Collecting unemployment, um, trying to get unemployment from um, the state of Illinois mm-hmm. was absolute hell. Yeah, uh, and it took months and months to try and before they would start paying. Yeah. Even though I was entitled to it legally because yep. having worked over a year at a a job where technically well, I was, W-2. my employer was in Illinois. In Illinois. You're supposed to get unemployment. Now. Yeah. But man, I've never been so stressed out. Uh, I think well, it's not quite true. That was the most stress I've ever undergone since the week that my mom died. <laughs> Yeah. Was that like actually right before Christmas that year when we mm-hmm. were out of money, I had cashed out 401k, I had spent all our savings, I had racked up our credit cards and there was, there was nothing, nothing. And I kept thinking that we're, I was about to get unemployment payments yeah, and now. they told me on the phone, oh, coming. no, it's not coming. Oh, sorry, that was wrong. It's not coming because we actually... Uh, it's just our policy for people who are out of state. We just, uh, don't pay. We don't pay. We pretend that the pro- paperwork's in progress and we lie to you. Uh, and then just don't send anything. And then we don't send anything. And then we just wait until you like get an attorney or, or something. something. Yeah. And I don't even remember how I finally shook that. Shook loose. it out of them. But, but they, came. they did eventually pay. And, yes. and it lasted, was it? It was six months or more. With the help of some friends who actually just gave us cash yeah. to pay our mortgage, mortgage. we, we made through. it just just barely we squeaked through, through on food stamps, WIC, and unemployment yeah. until I got a contract job with Dow. Yeah. yeah. And that was, a, that was 45 minutes away working yep. on the Dow Chemical Campus. Yeah. And talk about grim and demoralizing. That was pretty grim and demoralizing. Yeah. And I think what it came down to was the realization that, well, this may be a contract job forever. It, like, it may never go anywhere, right? Yeah. Um, the, but they that, were not... My boss had no... Um, couldn't... Even after six months or whatnot, there was no indication that he was going to get enough funding somehow to, to open a permanent position. They just right. didn't hire... That's the thing you learn is that they're not really hiring. Dow Chemical in Midland is a Potemkin village of a chemical plant that is mostly yes. empty and mostly shut down yes. and is kept reasonably safe and reasonably functional um, by an army of contractors. An army of contractors. Who are all temps. All Everyone temps, works through Kelly, Kelly, girls. Kelly Technical Services. Yep. And the number of actual Dow employees is very small. Maybe a hundred, you know, something. It's it's comically small. It's comically small, and it's like ten thousand contractors, and maybe what thousand employees. Thousand employees, right? Some some absurd imbalance like that. Yeah. And there was some talk about a permanent position, but no indication that that was actually in the pipeline, actually possible. But that was the reality, right? That 
if we were going to stay, yeah, you would have to work would, at Dow. And we would have had to move to Midland if I was going to keep that job. Which would not be staying. Right. Right. So, and the, so, and, and we and didn't that, want to move you, to Midland. Midland's an incredibly racist Jesus. and backwards place. Midland, well, that's not, well, I wouldn't call it backwards exactly. I'd call it, you know, Middle Michigan's Ann Arbor. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> And anyway, it's not some place I'd want to live. Overtly racist everywhere. N- not some place I'd want to live. Yeah. Or raise my children. No. I know it's very nice for the lovely white people that live there. I have many friends there whom I love. Who love and they it. Great. And, they, yeah. and they love it. And they should. It's a great town for and, them. And some of them are Dow employees. Oh, and yeah. they're happy to work for Dow. Right. The company that poisoned the whole region. Right. We weren't happy to work for Dow. No. I it did. Was, yeah. I liked my supervisor, and I liked mm-hmm. the work because actually the project I was working on involved embedded code for remote sensors, which was um, for packaging and for water quality and for imaging of uh, insects in grain storage facilities. To go, f- yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I got to write some cool code. I got to work with some cool people and. My boss was happy. I gave present with what I was doing. I right. gave some presentations on the code. I turned it, it right. into a framework they could work with. It was, it was you know, good. It but was good in that way. In that way, but the but bottom line was it's a weird and demoralizing place to if work. If we were going to stay in that house in Saginaw, yeah, like this was the job. Yeah, this this is what there no, was. No, yeah, do you mean? You mean there's no other employer, right? There was that no other would employer. have anything like this kind of work something something that you could do right you could be paid for right and we could k- keep on right Some, something something in other words something i'm actually that actually pays enough to raise a family on right and that has something to do with my skill set right and it was 45 minutes away yep and for an employer you wouldn't cost across the street for i mean we were there because we were desperate yeah we needed the money you know we were young we needed the money <laughs> so there we were it and was it was definitely moral. I was definitely more conflicted like about working there. Working for Dow, um, and that really wasn't how we wanted to do this. Right. Right. I mean, and and back to what I was saying earlier, we'd had this idea that you know, I've been employable in my life. I've been you right. Know, I, I wouldn't right. necessarily describe myself as someone who's easily employable. Everyone pisses me off, but. Um, but I've had jobs before. You've, I, you've been, you, your uh, middle class accoutrements, speech patterns, uh, vocabulary, and basic skills have always got get me make in, you employable in, like, in a lot of like office jobs, especially for in, in the nonprofit or religious community. Oh yeah, yeah, a lot of settings could yeah. comfortably be employed. Yeah. Um. So that's still true. Yes. But there are no jobs like that in Saginaw available. No, because there's no exist. there's no middle class. There's not there's nothing like that. I mean, and so anyone who has that kind of job is not leaving. Yeah, they're yeah. not leaving. This is it. It's very know? few. The only jobs like that in Saginaw are like social services agencies, and well, those well, like are with the state, and so and on. those are state jobs, right? right. And um, very hard to get. Very hard to to keep. To stick well, not with. hard to keep. Hard, hard to keep, hard to stick with. Well, hard to keep when they start trying to get you fired, and you have to get your oh, union yeah, involved yeah. and all this because they're because they do have legal protections. Right. They're unionized jobs, but they're low paying, they're low yeah. status, and you yeah. know. So there's and there you, aren't that you many of them. Deal with a state bureaucracy, and there aren't that many of them. Yeah. And I think so. I figured between that, the two that of us, a hospital system, we could get some kind of job. Two, somewhere between two, the two of us we could work even working all opposite shifts for opposite Christ shifts sake. two lower paying jobs but you and know still make things the work. opposite shifts thing not worth it not worth it not well not yeah not worth it to us to stay there right and never see our family together. never see never be together never see each other and so um no, and like what each of us would see half, half the kids for half, half the, the day or something. or something like that you know like so like we'd all we'd never actually be asleep at the same time or working at the same time or home at the same time. Yeah. Right? Because when I need to sleep, you need to be watching the kids. Right. And 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 while you need to work, I need to be watching the kids. And <laughs> some you know, like it's, this people people it's like make, an O. Henry story. <laughs> yeah, you know you shaved your head to pawned your hair to buy a chain for my watch, watch and I pawned, pawned your, your watch, watch to buy you combs for your hair. hair. Yeah. yeah, something like that. Something um, like no, that. it's just it's 
And people, people do it. People do that kind of thing, and they make it work, even with young children. I, 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 I bo- it boggles the mind. If there's a, you know, and and we, you know, we, we did have like like Orwell who could mm-hmm. have left, right? We did have a, a community that we were from where there were other jobs. There were other jobs, and so finally, after six months at Dow or whatnot. Bit the bullet. I, I had been applying for other jobs, um, and I think the job you're in now was actually available. Right when you were February, first, <laughs> right? Like January, right? Yeah, no, it was listed. It took uh, ages. Not, now I don't want to criticize my employer publicly much. <laughs> it, took, it took, but it took ages to get uh, an interview. Thor Thor Labs um, bureaucracy uh, did not forward my application to the guy who's currently my boss and right. they for for whatever reason my application sat in limbo for at least three or four months hmm. and i kept and it and what was frustrating is it really seemed like an ideal match yes right like i had just the experience they were looking for yes and was interested in this kind of work yes and so that's actually a lot of jobs you're not surprised when they never call you back but this is like this what? Is like really they, they never so heard like there were a lot of guys like me lined up meanwhile I, my know. boss was desperately calling hr looking for someone saying really Anything? is there nobody else that applied because we really they were gonna like hire student interns or do crazy it's things with training things, people right. or, trying to make it work yeah but then they finally saw my resume and they're like, okay, we have to hire this guy right away. <laughs> how soon can you start? And it was really, how soon can you start? Uh, yeah. And they, and I think you were like temping or like uh, 1099 with them for yeah. like a month I, or something. Yeah, I started before like they could working, even right. hire me. I, right. I was actually working from home briefly, briefly. for Thor Labs because they needed before you started officially that much on this project. And so, um, so it was really naive in 2010 when I was thinking yeah. that there, that jobs that, that you had, somehow we could, we could, even if we lost the good paying, the good job, paying job, that there were two modest paying jobs that we could both work. Yeah. Like that just, they didn't exist. No. They, those, those jobs just weren't there. And the jobs yeah. that were there are like nighttime stock clerk at Walmart, you know, or, yeah. or um, orderly or, or things at the that hospital system. I, or, I know I'm patently not qualified for. Or like I'm not a machinist. Well, you see, right, but you see, and you see a lot of like work at the mall selling cosmetics in the kiosk, you know, yeah. right? And those jobs aren't even jobs aren't in good. that you're really like it's like it's, a you're paid piece work. It's yeah. like an MLM multi level marketing scheme yeah. thing. Where you get like if right. you're paid, it's paid uh, commission and so on. Right. Right. So there, are yeah. job listings for the area like a lot, an awful lot of the jobs are are either very entry, very low pay jobs, and, or and they're gross. not even jobs. jobs. There's like scams, you know, yeah. like straight up scams. And um, yeah, the, but the the kinds of jobs I was imagining, so from a temp from a temp agency or something, yeah, were just non-existent, just yeah. straight up like, non-existent. Even when I was a teenager in Los Angeles. I could go to a temp agency and go into an office and do computer work for them. Right. Right. And, you know, it was just there. You could go do it. Type stuff, word processing. I could and, do that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. No. Yeah, because I could type. <laughs> I'm a pretty good this. writer. Yeah, answer phones. Um, just not there. Just not, just not there. there. That wasn't available there. And, and yeah, and there just wasn't other telecommute work. It didn't exist. No, it's it's not to, not to speak of the whole promise of telecommuting. Not to pontificate too much about this, but mm-hmm. largely outside of some very peculiar and specific markets in the Bay Area or the New York City area or the Austin area or whatnot. Not a thing. Um, it's not really a thing, and it was yeah. promised to be a thing, but no, it's not, not that thing. it doesn't work and people can't do development work that way. Not at all. It's that management doesn't want to deal with it. Yeah, and, I don't want to deal with and what that what that usually means is that they just don't want to be bothered even to dial that number and put someone on the conference call. 
Right. Right. That's, yeah, I don't bother. It's too much work. It's too, too much, much extra work. Yeah. Or to CC someone on an email. email. Yeah, I waste my time. And that's really... That's what it comes down what to. What it is. And it, uh, I'll, I'll say, it does require a little extra work for a yeah. manager to deal with a team that's part remote. Yes. Electronics did it all the time because half the people in a given meeting were in the remote offices. Right. But they did not want to do it for one guy. For an individual. And, well, and they did not want to, like, make that a thing they did. Right. Like and, some kind of a standard, hire people in as telecommute. And I, I was the butt of jokes in meetings, and my boss never corrected anyone. Like right. I would say, I'm I, at one point I said, I'm taking... I've arranged to take, uh, you know, on on the twentieth. I'm going to be off for the for you know for my vacation. I'm taking you know four days off four or days something off, like that. I'll be on vacation. And one of my coworkers say, "I thought you were always was on, on vacation. vacation." It was up to my boss to say he's not always on vacation. vacation. And it was up. All I could say was, "Well, my idea of a vacation is not actually sitting here in my office every morning." You know, that's not how I do. For, but for fun. no one would defend me. Right. And in specific, my manager would not defend me. As like, and, you know. You know, he was an appalling, weaselly, sniveling little, little man. man, honestly. Yeah. And I'm not going to mention his name, but. Oh, he was a little man. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah, I never did like him. That aside. Born again Christian. You know, no, Sunday school bitch- teacher. Enough bitching and moaning. Yeah. Um. So what it came down to was... I said I wasn't going to (laughs) complain. What it really came down to was, after two years, the bottom line was that we could work at Dow and we could stay. Yeah. Yeah. 90 minutes of commuting. 90 minutes of commuting a day. Being at the security gate at 8 a.m., you know. Yeah. For for Dow. And... um, if that's what if this is what it took, we we could we couldn't just stay. Um, yeah. So we never realized hospitality the way we wanted to. This was actually a very interesting little sort of sub fact. Mm-hmm. Um, we would occasionally, and I would freak. We would occasionally, and I would frequently, um, look to see if there were folks that needed hospitality. Yeah. Like we'd look. Yeah. We'd look around. It'd be cold weather. See if anybody sleeping rough, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. There never was. We actually would was. drive around downtown in the winter looking for Anyone homeless people. Sleeping rough, et cetera. Homeless. And I remember um, driving, stopping by, uh, you know. We thought we saw some Empty building. Mm-hmm. And there was like a bundle in front of the building. Or like, shit, I hope that's not a person lying there who's right. dead. Right. And got out of the car and actually like peeled away the debris and whatnot and it was just it was just like um plastic wrap or something yeah yeah so we would we actually never found someone and the sort of there's it's twofold number one um so saginaw kind of looks like uh dresden after the bombing but cleaned up (laughs) yeah in that like all these buildings are missing there's all these missing teeth all these Uh, missing houses you know whole neighborhoods gone right and um you it's eerily empty yeah I think in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were some huge homeless sweeps where people will literally just bust out of town. Bust out of town, bust out of town. Yeah. And the folks who had family and were like rooted in the area, like really rooted, you mm-hmm. know, um, they all found semi-permanent housing in some fairly, in a fairly robust shelter system. Mm-hmm. Um, between like, a, a, there's a, there was a women's, what used to be a Catholic worker that I think shut down a year or two before you came to town, yeah. um, turned into a women and children's shelter. Mm-hmm. There was, uh, which is fairly large. They're actually, they're very large. They're actually adding a building this year. And they just finished a capital campaign. They're adding a building. Hmm. Um, and then there's uh, was a, a single adult shelters, a single men's shelter, and then a women's shelter, all of which are, as these things go, well funded by the local religious community and secular community. Yeah. And so you didn't see anybody out sleeping rough. Not really. It just didn't happen. Um, because um, either the police would route them. Yeah, roused. 
roust them or or they would go to these shelters and find shelter Mm -hmm. and um unlike other situations in other places it it wasn't as um it wasn't really this 90 days and you're out it's kind of like we've got so many beds and people fill them Mm -hmm. and uh, when we run out of beds then we can talk about when someone has to leave but we're only having that conversation when we run out of beds and what happened is as they run out of beds there are all these empty buildings. They had another building. So, you know. Yeah. So lots really, of buildings. Lots of empty buildings. So as there are people that need a place to stay, um, there's a core community that's making that happen. That's part of the religious community and the secular, like United Way mm-hmm. sort of group. Mm-hmm. And um, so that, in in some way, was not actually a need in Saginaw. Right. Was not actually an, like an open need. No, but we, we had other... Um, Aspirations. Idea, aspirations and ideas too. Uh, there's a podcast episode about our garden project. Yeah, that was a great project. It was, and, going, it was I, it's like so many things. It germinated and started to kind of go, and then fell, fell flat. Yeah, and yeah. we were besides our own gardening, our intention for the property, mm-hmm. having a large piece, a large lot, right, mm-hmm. third an extra, of an acre, an extra lot in downtown, was to get other people involved. Yes. And have other people actually growing food on our property. Yeah. And we kind of did. We had two guest people who did some stuff there. Were really active. And one of them came back the next year. And yeah, and it just kind of fizzled. It you know? kind of fizzled. I think I want you to talk about a couple other reasons why our why we got discouraged. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, are you thinking of the neighbors or what, what are you thinking of? I'm thinking of Child Protective Services. Oh, yeah. And our uh, increasingly dismal relationships with the neighbors. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, number one, um, some of the best relationships I've ever had I formed in Saginaw. Um, I'm still close friends with several people. Um um, I, I think that's where I, the only place I've ever found my tribe outside of um, my where I grew up. Yeah. And, never, never really in Ann Arbor. Yeah, no, not really. Um, maybe yeah. There's people. There are many people here in the Ann Arbor area that I like. Yeah. And care for very much. But but yeah, it that, just that, seemed like they had your goals. I they had my goals. They, like this was these were my sisters, you know. Yeah. Um. That aside, and that happened for me in Saginaw and, and was very special to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, very rewarding. Partly because it's just it's a more integrated city. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right? Um, but our actual immediate neighbors, the people that like literally lived in the houses next door to us, yeah, and like lived on our street, uh, many of them are really antagonistic. I, I have to say, I want to say that like so. Let's say there's a hundred people on the street. Mm-hmm. We had probably two or three, maybe five folks that we were really friends with. Yep. We really liked out of the state of the hundred. Um, and then like maybe fifteen or so. Yep. Not every I did. I don't really know all their identities. Right. That really did not hostile. like us. Yeah. Were like really hostile, like openly hostile. Did not like us. We tried to participate in community activities. Right. Um, things like the, there was a hymn, door to door, like hymn singing. Oh, like there's thing. a Christmas caroling. Christmas, sorry, hymn singing. Christmas, Christmas caroling. caroling. Right. And um, like, uh, like, a, like a sort of a neighborhood Christmas party. Yeah. And the, the class and race differences were just always visceral. This, so, yeah. We had a weird incident I want to call out where um, it was the second year that we were involved in the Christmas caroling. Yes, yeah. And we actually had, because we had this huge space, this huge family room, and honestly, our house was like the iconic house in the neighborhood. Yes. Not the only one in the area that was a very nice, large house, but it was the biggest and the the most recognizable, I think, of the neighborhood. Right. Um, And... So we had arranged so that after caroling, we were inviting anyone who wanted to drop by to stop in our family room, hang out, warm up, and have some eggnog. Have some eggnog. We had booze. We had all our booze out. All these like Christmas, you know, Christmassy snacks, right? And whatevers, you know. People, our neighbors, would walk up to our front door, and somehow would just stop dead. 
as if they were actually f- suddenly found themselves terrified or panicked yeah. or unable to th- step over the threshold because of like a force field or something. It was bizarre. It was spooky. Yeah. We're like, oh, why? Come on in. Yeah, this, this is the place. There's another uh, thing that I want to yeah. mention that happened earlier where mm-hmm. you were hosting a get-together for a group. Those were occupied people, though. Was that the one you're thinking of? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. That was so you, demented. You were so hosting a get-together for a bunch of occupied people. Yep. And you told them where you lived and where the house and was what and what not, what time. And you saw them show up in the neighborhood, drive past the house, turn around, drive past the house again. Stop at the house. Stop at the house and then leave. Yes. Because uh, they, as you put it, that can't be the home of a black person. Not possible. And this they, must they be had, the wrong... They, they had they, met you. Yeah, they had met And me. you said, this is my house. This is my house. It's clearly numbered. It's clearly numbered. It's not ambiguous. <clears throat> There's a garden in the table for us to do the garden thing they were coming to set up in the yard. A, a big garden. Yeah. Uh, the, it's all visible, right? It's all visible. Nothing's ambiguous. Except that it, it was a big house, a really big, like fancy... Fancy house. What appeared to be expensive. There's literally nothing ambiguous about what was happening. Right. Um, and so they literally drove all over town trying to figure out... So they just like drove over to the east side and started driving looking at random lots. Right, because they thought that Grace must live on the east side because yes. that's where the black folks live. Yes. Uh, it was stuff like that. It was a that. real head scratcher. Yeah. But, uh, the, the, stuff I, but with the, the stuff with the neighbors who literally couldn't come in, even though they, I'm sure, would have liked a, a Oh, they would have loved the belly booze. Yeah, they would have loved some free booze and, you know, and, and some not to nosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. was all, was baffling. It was always baffling. It sort of set the tone when we got there that people were immediately lecturing us about property values, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, and how they were looking at our family and talking about property values. Yeah. Um, and then we we had the police called on us. Um, I was yeah. carrying around Benjamin. Must have been Benjamin. It was Benjamin, yeah, in a... In a Baby carrier on your back. And a baby carrier. A doing backpack your baby carrier yeah, in one of my walks. walks. Grace would sometimes give me a kid to take with me. It was good exercise. Mm-hmm. And the kid would sleep. Yeah. Right. It would fall asleep. Mm-hmm. If the if Benjamin was howling or being which obnoxious, which he often was, then, yeah. was, was, was not, you know, was getting in your face and you were a little fed up, you could put Just him in the pack. The I would go walk a couple miles and after about half a mile the child would inevitably just fall asleep and yeah. it's just a thing it's soothing to young children to Change carry them and walk them yeah. just the way some kids like to be driven around right, right? They like to ride around the car and fall asleep this yeah way. so this was really good for us in lots of ways so but someone called the police because apparently as they told the police i was like carrying a, a, a baby around in a backpack and like the cop imagined that I had a dead baby in a backpack a or something. Sport, I don't know. Just yeah. over your shoulder, just walking around. And actually, the officer was very polite and just said, can I ask you, you know. And he, he just got a, got a good look at, I said, you can look. He got a good look at the baby in the pack and said, like, oh, that's like designed to be a baby, baby carrier. carrier. Like, yeah. Yeah. You want me to wake him up? He's like, no, it's no, fine. It's just... <laughs> Have a nice day. So uh, yeah. it was no real trouble, but, but like, just the fact that I was out there every single morning for years. Right, right. Right. Oh, no, and like um, our nine-year-old riding her bike up and down the street, someone was threatening to call CPS because our nine-year-old was riding her bike up and down the street unsupervised. And then later it got so bad that if the kids were in the yard right, and you were in the house, if they were playing in our yard. In our yard. They would threaten to call the police or CPS because, because the kids were unsupervised. Yes. Or like if they were walking on the sidewalk, they'd pull over and like shout for me because the children were in the street. We also... Now, mind you, this boulevard yeah. is full of people walking from sunup to sundown walking in the street. Yeah. It's actually a very low traffic area. Yep. And... I, I actually I found it a little bizarre when I we first moved there that at like 
at, starting you know, at dawn. Af- starting at dawn in the morning, there's like the, all the dog walkers, and then at different I, points during the day, um, the retirees, retirees and strollers and whatnot. And then like after dinner, yeah. there in the summer, especially there were often groups after of people. After school, there'd be another wave of children walking right. around, and people just walk in the street. Walk in the street, right? It was very common. I found it weird. Right. It was hard for me to get used to the ha- actually walking. I remember in the I had street. a friend visiting. And I was talking to her about how people were asking about the kids being in the street or being, and they weren't even in the street, but like it's yeah, this thing. Right. And um, and she was like, "Oh wow, that's weird. How 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 rude is that? You know, they could just knock on your door, blah blah blah." Right. Um, and she went out to take a phone call, like on the front lawn or something like she needed a quiet place yeah and she came back inside i can't have a conversation i can't have a conversation out there it's a fucking parade everyone's done with yeah. dinner and they're yeah. in the street right like the whole neighborhood a is out of, in the goddamn so street a lot of people socialize in this way and go right. strolling just, yeah, and go walking strolling, it was out. very that was something we liked about the neighborhood yeah it was very but it turned out everyone was was of everyone out doing that was a member of the the Stasi, you uh, know, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. And they were all too happy to get the state involved, right? Uh, 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 the police involved when it was anything having to do with the black family. Yeah, that was a thing. Yeah, that was a problem of some kind. And and don't forget, I mean, I don't want to call her out by name, but we did have a friend who kind of went crazy on us. Yeah. And she was watching our kids, and she wound up like reporting us to cps for the kids being unsupervised while she was watching them. yeah so she was we actually were paying her to to uh watch them yeah at and like several just a couple blocks from our house like at a playground walk to a park it's right a, yeah because there are parks around oh right? yeah it, yeah i gotta, I gotta hammer this home it was a great little neighborhood yeah Yeah. there was a uh playground next to the church yeah what five six blocks away for that yeah Yeah. and i used to the kids would walk there and she Mm -hmm. was with them and and they were at the playground as their supervisor and then she was calling cps saying the kids were unsupervised roaming unsupervised (laughs) which you know how how off the rocker is and this? She was a person being paid to supervise. Yeah, and we also allowed like our older kids to mm-hmm. walk a couple of blocks to a party mm-hmm. store to spend a buck or two of their allowance to buy some chips and candy, bubble gum, bubble yeah. gum or whatever. Right. And like the that was a thing. That, that was, was a, thing. a that was a big no no. Oh dear. A- a- Except it wasn't a thing. It was only a thing if our children did. It was only a thing for our kids. If our kids were riding their bikes up and down the the street, street. Uh, on the sidewalk it was a crisis the right. neighbor kids would like f- like or like in other people's yards <sighs> climbing their trees and running vandalizing, you know, vandalizing. actually van- the white neighborhood kids would actually vandalize our trees and our front wall and our property and they'd be biking everywhere and screaming and fighting and whatnot and it was yeah. not a thing it's not a thing but the you can't have black kids roaming. That's, roaming, that's dangerous or something. Yeah, and they're not even very black, right? Right, <laughs> right. Um, so that just became. And mind you, oh, I was break, doing this breakdown. So there's a hundred people. There's five or five or so people that you know we're friends with. We're yeah. Like I still keep in touch with them. We're still good friends. I think fondly of them. And then like maybe fifteen that really actively dislike us. Yeah. And the other eighty, well, like just don't know us. Right, or like if they hear about us or something we're doing, they're like, "Stop by, hey, how's it going? This is cool. What is, what's happening here?" Right. Kind of interaction. They're they're very neutral. So the fifteen that really just didn't like us yeah. had this outside outsize For, voice uh, and influence. Yeah. yeah, voice influence and effect. Um, where it was just really untenable. By the last couple of years, I just couldn't let the kids play outside. So let that sink in. Uh, you know, literally. The last couple of years, yeah, including after I started commuting to Ann Arbor. Arbor. So right. when I when I try to bring it closer to the present, right. 2015, when I finally got this job with Thor Labs, I agreed to commute. I, I agreed. I told my boss that we will relocate closer to this job, right? Not necessarily in Ann Arbor, but close to Ann Arbor, right? Um, and. I started commuting, and I started crashing with friends who were kind enough to let me uh, sleep on the, like the two or three nights a week right. on a couch in their garage for over a year, yeah. <laughs> a year and a half. Yeah, for a while. Um, while I did this. 
and then you'd be home like weekends and like yeah. Another, I arranged to and work, you work from home like one or two days a week. I had set it up so I was typically working from home on Fridays, right? Which meant that I would leave early Monday morning, drive down to Ann Arbor, stay three nights, come back Thursday after work, come back Thursday after work, and then work from home Friday. And go from there. Right. And that, I have to say, really also got old and demoralizing. Yeah, I got very old. And during this time, you were basically trapped in the house with the kids. Yeah, pretty much. You couldn't let them play outside. No. It was always it was always a thing. And um, without, you know... Yeah, it was, it was just always a thing. To have and it just got worse. Right, it just it got, got worse. progressively worse. Right. Just... And like really I started, bizarre I started worrying issues. that you were actually starting to suffer from like some kind of paranoid breakdown, but it it wasn't. No, I wasn't. I wasn't being paranoid. These things right. were just happening. They really were happening. We really were getting that much harassment. <laughs> just I don't know for living there. And I have to say, all right. So people are like, oh well, you know, Saginaw. What the, is such a like the rest of the state outside of Ann Arbor is so racist. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, is it safe there? Yeah. Um. All the friends I made were like outside. Like, if you look at a little map of the area, mm-hmm. the area in which we lived was like this, um, a liberal island. In, in in Ann Arbor or in no Saginaw? in Saginaw. Oh, so if you look at the demographic, we, we were map, in this enclave that was one of the nicer neighborhoods. One of the nicer know. neighborhoods, and it was a liberal enclave. Yeah. Like this sort of liberal island in this sea of red all the way around it. But it's not really red because it's still a democratic area. Yes. But yes. they were like blue dogs. They were right. they were they were conservative Democrats. They were conservative Democrats, right? And so I don't just mean conservative. I mean yeah. Yeah. Um I mean, like they're not conservative like I'm conservative, for example, right? Right. Um so we lived in this one sort of like no, quote, Fox, Fox News conservative. Fox News conservatives, Democrats, right? <laughs> but, but still Democrats because their parents have been Democrats. Their parents have right? been Democrats. Everyone they know We're are Democrats. Ethnic Democrats, it, precisely. But we lived in this island of this blue island mm-hmm. of these very sort of liberal environmental activists and so on, like yeah. well, like to all of our neighbors. Yeah, you know this very sort of progressive ethic. Yeah. Um. And that's where this happened. Yeah. Everyone else outside the 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 liberal island, um, were delightful. You know that that's where I made right. all these these friends right. across a lot across the river. A lot across True. the river on the east side, and, 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 and then honestly, outside. Yeah, and honestly, had we understood the demographics of the area a little better when mm-hmm. we moved, we wouldn't we would have ignored everyone's advice to stay away from the east side, right? We would have ignored it, absolutely. Because even today, I'm still on like Saginaw subreddit and people talk about moving to Saginaw and they're moving there and they want to know where to live and whatnot. And everyone uniformly says, oh, you don't uh, you don't want to be in, in Saginaw itself. You want to be in the township. Yeah, right? no, that's dangerous. Don't right, do that. so live in the township. It's like, okay. Right. Mm-hmm. But, and then, but if... If someone says, no, I, I, I am living, I'm going to be in Saginaw, people say, well, you'll be plenty safe as long as you never go on the other side of the river. Yeah. Right. And the other side of the river is kind of where it's nice. <laughs> it's <laughs> To be honest. It's where where all the people that actually worked in these in these um, GM plants actually live. The workers, I workers mean. Actually, the yeah. laborers, not laborers. the management. No, the laborers. It's yeah. the black side of town. Right. Literally and split down by, with a river. With a river in between. And so the sort of white liberal neighborhood was just hell on wheels. Yeah. Just hell on wheels. And this is why I would uh, get in so much trouble on Facebook and whatnot when I would say... Um, I would say, so we're still looking for a place to live, but we're really looking for a place where we don't have white neighbors. Yeah. And, you know, I'd settle for no neighbors or next to no neighbors, but I really don't want to have white middle-class neighbors. Yeah. And I would just get called, all my liberal friends would just be like, every name in the book, you were such a racist. How is that not racist? That's that's one of the most racist things I've ever heard. And I'm like, yeah, no, cry me a river. This has been our experience. Yeah. Is that white liberals are the, absolutely the worst to black families. Just a fucking Or mixed nightmare. families or Just Hispanic a families. Just nightmare. 
They are yeah. the worst. And they believe they're being entirely justifiable and oh, righteous in everything they do. They're keeping children safe. They're keeping children safe. It's all about... It's very important. It's they're all in the rhetoric of safety and security and uh, strong about, communities and safe yeah. communities. And it has nothing to do with it takes a animosity of about color yeah no it takes a village you've got to like step in and care for these children but you're an interesting case study because all your signals are upper middle class oh every one of them i can't hide them apparently yeah and but yeah and which leaves only one thing there's really only one thing you're concerned about right there's literally nothing and it's naked (laughs) it's exposed in this way because i'm i earn a lot of money you know, yeah, yeah. compared to the people we were next to, I was a rich man. You yeah, know? even when employed, you were a rich man. Yeah, yeah. And I'm educated be- way beyond most of the people I was around, and totally. you're educated way beyond most of the people you're around. Right. Uh, and yeah, dress and mannerism, even vocabulary. You know, yeah. even accent. Even and when all I'm this. wearing my ragged jeans. Right. It right. comes through. Right. And so literally the only, it leaves you naked, but the only thing exposed like, that makes you stand here? out for people to jump up and down and hyperventilate about is your color. That's it. That would be it. That would be the only thing. So. Yeah. So so that, those were our neighbors. Right. When I say neighbors, I don't mean like in this broad sense, like our literal yeah, neighbors. Yeah, like literally across the street. Across the street, next door. And, down. and, and of the five yeah. like folks that we liked yeah. out of the hundred... Like three of them moved, yeah. Right, so um, three three of the uh, from right from our neighborhood, they, right right from moved. our neighborhood. But then, let alone mean, the extended, meanwhile, all these extended people that we were networking with and doing projects with, were. I they, mean, they dozens fled. of people. They just fled. Literally, dozens of people over the course of five and to seven years. It wasn't. It wasn't white flight that drove them away. No, because they were the ones who were. These were people who had stayed. Right, and who were networking with us and, and had doing hung on stuff as long as they us. could. But it was literally the financial pressures just got to the breaking point. Someone lost their last lifeline job that was holding right. it together. And this is the. Their AmeriCorps run out, whatever it was that was yeah. able to keep them fed and housed there. We wanted actually, uh, you know, you talked about Catholic workers. We were thinking of having, you know, gardening interns and like seeing if we get students to move to this area so on graduation. Things. And just like offering people room and board to stay and like learn how to garden and grow food for a farmer's market and all that. Yeah. But one thing that I was always nervous about, and it was justifiably so, mm-hmm. because every time this thread snapped, we were in free fall, right. was all of this was really dependent largely on one income, on your my one, income. one job, your one job, which was basically a lifeline back to Ann Arbor where people get paid more. Yes. Right. And that, yeah. So it was basically importing money to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the fact that, and it just was this dream of ours that I could earn like an Ann Arbor salary and live in, in Saginaw. Saginaw. Yeah. And, but it wasn't even really an Ann Arbor salary because no. this place was so, so long. stagnated for seven years. I was mm-hmm. earning so it was actually, and the kept jacking up healthcare costs and, and all that. And to be that. perfectly honest, yeah, if our neighbor, if if we just had had say like five antagonistic, antagonistic neighbors, yeah. it wasn't like this sort of chorus, right? Right. Uh, just a couple, you know, mosquitoes in the tent, right? Yeah. Um, I think we would have fought to stay longer. Right. But we were basically under house arrest. Yeah. Yeah. And um, because any any time the kids right. left the building, we we were like, we cannot if, afford another visit from child protective services. services. Right. And if they left the building without an adult present, there was literally someone watching to complain about it. Yeah. I don't know who these people were. No. I mean, I would talk to them. Right. Because people kept saying, "Why don't you go talk to the neighbor?" They're yeah. all anonymous. Right. It was all anonymous complaints. All anonymous complaints, calls. just kind of muttering amongst themselves it would like find its way back to me or something right right and um but this sense of of like my single income being like the lifeline of everything we were trying to do there was just sort of an increasing psychic burden too yeah, yeah. and then the fact that all we were managing to achieve really was just to sort of 
keep on in this situation that was failing. It was failing. And it was not, well, that's what I mean by if we didn't have the antagonistic neighbors at all, yeah. or like just a few mosquitoes in the tent sort of neighbors. Right, right. Because, um, yeah, I could, you know. We really, we, yeah. we, some, some we're old losing asshole. our allies. Right. So some old asshole isn't really an issue. You right. Know, it was just, you know, kind of buzzing around. But like actually like a chorus of folks who are apparently watching in concert. Right. For the children to leave the house without an adult yeah. present. This is the, uh, this is why when people, when we moved there and people wanted us to like join in this neighborhood watch thing and put neighborhood watch signs in our windows that said you are being watched and like i'm like i'm good thanks i'm good i'm not putting a because i never was interested in being big brother being brother to my neighbors right that's just that's was so bizarre and so um that that was really that was the straw that broke the camel's back that if seriously we're gonna work at dow so we can live under house arrest to me neighborhood watch means george zimmerman that's what that means. That's what it means. What else is that? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so that's really where this broke down, where like we just couldn't stick it out any longer if we were also going to be like under attack from our closest neighbors. Right. We really needed allies, and we really needed our neighbors to be familiar with our goals and what we were trying to achieve. And, and like do. either not uh, attack, not right. opposed to them, or at least neutral. Right. If but not no, also like engaged in happy with them and i think that's in the big picture yeah that's a naivety that i i came with yeah where in not to be too uh cheeky but like the sort of white savior thing yeah that i as an upper middle class woman were gonna, was going to do something for this neighborhood of these people yeah and, and I, I didn't have quite that optimistic view but i was hoping to do something for my own family you know right which and, was to yeah. live in a big space and have i really, and share it and share it i really wanted when we when we checked out the the neighborhood mm-hmm. grace and i both saw in this neighborhood uh an opportunity to basically transport ourselves back to the 1970s yeah oh, because yeah. where as a kid i biked everywhere i walked mm-hmm. everywhere i was not locked in my house under house arrest like this and we have always wanted to have free range kids we wanted our kids to be able to have a village you know that they're outside with all that they're raised in to play outside with the other kids to um basically be feral you know and to have the opportunity come back when the streetlights go out to be to grow up in a situation that resembles the best experiences we had of our childhoods yes and th- this neighborhood seeming like it was sort of tr- uh, preserved in amber honestly really seemed I mean, and this was the tell we saw children doing that right really seemed like um ideal in a good many place to ways raise, raise a family yeah even though our financial situation was fragile and you know mm-hmm. nerve-wracking and we never really did figure out on even on my salary how to repair you know how to like do some serious projects get renovations done on the house and part of this is an ongoing problem because we can't still can't find good good contractors, contractors. in the area it who will up. who will reliably do do the work, on and do work. It well. Yeah. And that that was back then. Even trying to find someone to fix the furnace and stuff like that, yeah. it was a des- often a desperate scramble to find anyone who could show up and do the job. Right. So it was, yeah. Or like uh, we wanted to like do some serious work to the uh, heating system and yeah. pull out both old furnaces, integrate. People and would, wouldn't wouldn't even bid on. Wouldn't it. even bid on it. Right. Couldn't, we couldn't find someone to make a bid. We would have, and the guy we got in to do the flooring, who did such a great job. It's not from the area. It was not from the area. <laughs> no, we paid him to drive way. I mean, not not a million miles away, but it was like south of Flint. He was yeah. going, he was coming from south of like Flint. an hour drive, like an hour, yeah, about an or hour more. Hour. And um, that was every everything was like that. Right. If you found someone, they weren't from there. Right. right. And because I talked it, about people not very honest and whatnot. That was true of all the 
people we could find to do work. Do contract do work, yeah. They'd and say one thing, do another, and so you'd find out later how much we got, how much they didn't do. We got horribly ripped off on our gutter deal. Yeah, I had to borrow money to fix the gutters, and that turned right. out to be a disaster. And then, like six months later, there's still water running Streaming everywhere. everywhere. So, it's like we was always kind of stalled out trying to even get going on some of these projects and actually make a go of it. Right, and the and then after once I started yeah. losing jobs and like spending all my savings to to live, all that was off the table. And you know, cashing out four hundred one k's to off live. Off the table. There was no money. Right. There was There's no, no money liquid for. money to, to available to and actually to be clear, do any of that stuff. Um, that's when the the neighbors really got vicious. Yeah. It was after you yeah. lost your job. Yeah. That, I mean, they just just turned absolutely vicious. They were, you know, uh, had a polite face until they sensed that we were vulnerable in some way. Right. Right. Um, and that's just, you know, <laughs> insult to injury, right? I'm just saying. I don't know. So this, uh, um, so if we'd had neighbors like sort of on our team and engaged or, or neutral, yeah. Um, we may have tried to stay even longer. We may have, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I really, I think we would have been in a different frame of mind ha- had that been the case. Yeah. Um, but uh, at that point, when it was really clear that it was working at Dow under house arrest, and that was the deal. And that was the only thing available. Right. Um, it, it was... And, and yeah. feeling... And, you know, when we moved there, we noted... That there were a number of black families in our neighborhood. That, yes. That the neighborhood was fairly integrated as yes. far as these neighborhoods went. But you know what that I noticed we would upon see leaving? black families like out and working on their lawns and yep. whatnot. We're like, hey, this is a place where, uh, and even biracial couples. We biracial saw couples. a yeah, couple yeah. biracial oh, couples. Certainly more than I'd ever seen around here. Right. We're right. like, hey, maybe this maybe is this a place where they can actually accept us. Right. Right. Sounds good. Um, but you know, what, here's what I did not notice. Yeah. Until I was basically until we were packing up and leaving, is that all the black families have their entire yard fenced. Yes. With a six foot fence. Yes. And you only ever see them outside doing lawn maintenance on the front yard. Right. And they were all immaculate. They all had immaculate. Yeah. Yeah. lawns we were n- and that's the only time you ever saw them and they lived in fear of not having an immaculate lawn right because they couldn't not live up to someone else's standard. lawn standards right and that was never going to be us no, that was never neither gonna, grace or me has the slightest interest in taking care of a Mowing fucking lawn i yeah. mean i did mow it yeah right but i mean, I, mean I wasn't gonna break the law it was a fair amount of work to keep up with it but um but it was our we kept it up to effort. our standards. We wanted to kill our lawn and get rid yeah, of it. Yeah, we were hoping to kill. Yeah, right. So I mean, I kept it to some it with food to some minimal standard. But right. the people in our neighborhood, they were obsessive with their lawns. My yeah. God, it was an illness. It was like some kind of an illness with the lawns. But yeah, the, the, that's what I noticed upon leaving about all yeah. the, the black and yeah. Hispanic and um, their biracial. backyards were all had six foot fences. All had six foot fences. The maximum, actually, even slightly more than was legally than allowed. Was legally allowed to be right. fenced in. Right. And then they had these immaculate lawns, and the only time you saw them, right, was working on the lawn. Because in if they were outside, they were behind a fence because they knew they did not want their neighbors doing to them what they did to us. Right. And they certainly never like stood up to welcome people to their home. No. Right. Um, that was weird. Yeah, so. so that's what I noticed in, in in retrospect as we were leaving, that oh, like literally every single one of them, yeah, like they're here in the neighborhood, and you see them out, and that's how we know they're here, right? Uh, and you see them at uh, meetings, but like anyone who didn't fit that narrative, it became like it would turn into this thing at the neighborhood meetings, <laughs> like this, and really this disturbing thing. we did we we for a while we were going to the the neighborhood watch meetings yeah and we stopped yeah we stopped yeah it, it was um it was like nextdoor.com except in, in person in person yeah so there, you know some good and you know on its face i mean that's where we met the, the, the few people that we really liked that's where we met them some of them were engaged in that we're engaged group. in that yeah. we're you know 
community activist and so on. And I got active and did things with that group. And um, I do f- fondly remember a couple people who basically spent their time deflecting all the, the people shouting at those meetings. Right, just right. I was like, settle, calm settle down. down. You come, got this the spittle. Come on, yeah, man. Come on, this isn't a, a serious problem. This is no, a serious just, thing. You know, whatever. Yeah. And um, so, <clears throat> all that said, um, I, it, it it's hard to fully understand why it, all the whys of why it didn't work. Yeah. But it's um. It's. It, it's there are a it's, lot of factors. Yeah. A lot of it really fundamentally comes down to economics. Yeah. When people are broke, this is how it goes. They don't feel generous towards anyone who is different than they are, and anyone who might even slightly affect their property values. Their bottom line, yeah. in even the slightest way. Yeah, and yeah. this is, and this is actually what we're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, because we did leave, and we our house leave. is sitting empty, and. Yep. We've been trying for a year to sell it, mm-hmm. and if we do sell it now, it's going to be a huge blight on the the property values. Oh, because yeah. we're going to sell it for like <laughs> seventy five thousand, maybe if we're lucky. If we're lucky, we'll sell it for f- over fifty thousand less than we paid. Yeah, and it's not because the house has suffered fifty thousand dollars worth of deterioration no, or no. damage. No. It has suffered some deterioration and damage, damage and right. wear and tear. Uh, including some stuff that insurance is currently paying, paying us to, to fix. fix. Right. But but it's largely the house we bought. Yeah. In broad strokes. It's the house yeah. we bought. Um, and it was worth more than $128,000 then. Yep. Um, so Th- Things have continued to decline. To continue to decline. To continue especially to spiral. in the sense that there's just no one moving in. No one's moving in. Which is one of the things that I think we'd hope with this energy... Uh, when we had when we were moving there but we would uh, get not people wouldn't come move in to just be next to us but they would move in because there was a community forming a community right? forming and really and then doing stuff and there was an opportunity here to to be and like I think ground floor of a of a community organized thing and really I think so many of these deindustrialized cities mm-hmm are an opportunity. Yeah. They are. They're not op- all the infrastructure is there. In the, it's, you not know. in the conventional sense. No. Because nobody's going to make a ton of money. No one's going to make a ton of money unless, you know, you're kind of a scumbag. Unless you're I mean, the people who are making money are the people who run franchises. Well, run, well, and also the people who are like um or, greasing the right palms or who wind up um Earning money off of everyone else's misery when by buying up all their properties and flipping them, flipping or renting them, them or out. you know they open a dialysis center or something like that, right? Di- yeah, diabetes, dialysis, etc. Med- medical stuff, anything. But so yeah, you're not going to make you're not going to yeah. make a killing, but there's an opportunity. People don't people in like blue states not they don't realize how far the country has fallen. They have no clue. They do not see it. And, no, and it's it's kind of hard to show them. It's even even if you've lived there, and even if you've been there, and know people and met people and gone out of your way like Orwell did, you know, mm-hmm. it's hard to fathom to, to, to truly just fathom. how desperate it really is. Right, and so this sort of uh, pattern, this trajectory, we'd hoped <clears throat> to kind of just like not even turn it around just turn it on a different like slightly altered course we we had hoped that in some small way us moving there with our educations and income and projects and activism and you know, organizing could you know act as a, a focus of some other people's energies to, to and come and, help to come and maybe take help the same to co- opportunity. help to coalesce some stuff Right, going on, and because and you did. couldn't, because you know what, if you work in medicine or whatnot, yeah, there were jobs there for that, yeah, right. So jobs that we weren't specifically so, yeah, qualified for. for, but um, but yeah, like you know, if you wanted to be a machinist, if you wanted to be some of these um, uh, really blue collar jobs, um, there was work there, nursing, etc. Um. Like and we if were, you had experiences of like a truck mechanic or something. Something, yes. So we were hoping that all sorts of people might 
um, and not thousands or even hundreds, but I don't know, five. <laughs> dribs and drabs. Dribs and drabs, right? Might see an opportunity <clears throat> and, yeah. and, and go for it, yeah. right? And, and we really were hoping to at least do and continue and improve what we were doing with our own gardening. With our own gardening, which with our, is with our personal f- projects and with our sort of... Does. Which was literally to feed, to make like a demonstration project of feeding, uh, of partly feeding our whole family on the produce from our own yard. Right. Which we had a great we, bang up summer. We did. We did for one bang up for summer. For a while. Yeah. And uh, it was good, you know. But it, it was a project that never became anywhere even close to self-sustaining right? and just involved everything we did there was it always got shat on somehow yeah so for example Mm -hmm. the city offered compost Mm -hmm. and you have been part of a similar thing in ann arbor where you would get municipal compost for oh, like yeah. for like the saint francis community garden that you yeah. founded yeah it's right? old enough to vote now right <laughs> 18 years ago yeah. um but when we got compost delivered from the municipal place in saginaw yeah, it was full of cigarette but all kinds it of was trash. full of glass glass and trash trash cigarette butts those little plastic cigar mouthpieces yeah there was all full of plastic trash and and glass right and we would like uh, we couldn't digging. garden with it because we couldn't like we had to sift it we couldn't dig in our hands we'd be a, afraid of getting like oh look a hypodermic needle, needle or something right? right you know and we'd have to kind of weed that stuff out and this was just like seriously this is the municipal the compost? compost wow well yeah Damn. and yeah, then it is then we had remember the load of concrete too oh god yeah someone donated concrete rubble which we were which we used to some extent for some uh gardening projects like as a we were, like a retaining wall we were building a retaining wall we were hoping to build it out of urbanite right urbanite, which is right? broken up pieces of concrete it, from a building project it was trash and it was full of asbestos yeah it was really it was just full of asbestos and trash yeah so yeah yeah i so, mean which you know to be honest yeah that may be par for the course, doing urbanite, right? Maybe. I don't know. Um, maybe. I haven't done a lot of urbanite projects in a lot of other places. Right. But, um, but, I've, but we hope for better. <laughs> we hope for better. And we explained to them this, what this was for, right? Right. Um, but hey, it just came, dumped it, I was there, good to go. Yeah. And the uh, and I certainly, and I, I've gardened for a long time. Yeah. I've, municipal compost is not a new thing. Right. I got it back in the 80s. Right, <laughs> like, right. I, I, I've never gotten like that kind of trash in your compost. I mean, certainly, I, I would have a stray, you know, gum wrapper or something like that, whatever. But it wasn't like no, it's was literally full of plastic just, flags. And, you know, just all this chaff. Yeah, I I want to say a good five percent by volume. Yeah, five yeah. percent of the volume of the compost was trash. Yeah, it was it was horrible. Yeah, so you know there was that, and you know we we grew great food with it just the same. <laughs> Yeah, like we, you know, but, we we worked with it we did it but but yeah but have the effort of having to pick through everything like that. Well, it's just kind of like huh so this is how it is um yeah we we got some great support from the lds the community they came and built that uh the they did the eagle scout project oh yeah 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 that was but i had i had very good consistent positive relationships and experiences Throughout Saginaw with pretty churches. much, well, churches and pretty much anyone that was not in our immediate neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Who didn't feel like personally threatened by us. By our existence. By our existence or something. Some, like really view us as an existential threat of some kind. Yeah. Um, how did you put it? There's uh, like nothing like a, oh, not, something about a working class white woman who thinks a black woman is doing better than she is. So, oh, something God. like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even remember. Yeah, but it was, th- there was, it was really like an existential threat. Yeah, yeah. Um, our presence there. Oh, our neighbors on behind us in the house behind us just despised us from the get go. Oh yeah. And their boys molested our daughter. Like right, right. They were like we were the ones who should have been you know enraged and enraged furious and with furious them. and calling the cops and calling right. you know authorities. 
because of their children. Right. But, you know, it was the other way the I've whole time. Our daughter harassed. harassed and bullied our disabled child. And it yeah. was just, we're just real, just real a pair of little shits. To us. You know? But, um, yeah. and, uh, you know, my kids are little shits. And I don't, I don't mean to be, to pretend. But um, <clears throat> they really did not like us for some reason. Right. Right off the bat. Right off the bat. I, you know, I don't know. And, um, and I know I'm kind of snarky. I'm not. I'm not a very nice person. But, um, I mean, I know this about myself that I'm kind of a weirdo. Yeah. Um. But yeah, they were really, um, uh, taken aback and not in a good way. Yeah. So, yeah. um, what's the what's the code here? What's the so right? So now we're we've had the house in the market for more than a year. Yeah. We've had one offer that was accepted and has fallen through. The seller, um, the offer was contingent on the seller selling her, her own house. home. And that sale. And she was convinced that that wouldn't be difficult. Yes. In fact, it totally didn't happen. It didn't happen. Yeah. Well, and it, she was convinced it wouldn't be difficult. It didn't seem like it would be difficult. Right. The buyer she had was not, did not work out. Yeah. So, it so didn't work she, out. So, she, rather than ask us for more time, she just pulled the plug. Pulled the plug. Which... I'm honestly grateful. Well, she was unbalanced. She was a difficult buyer to work with. She was but. difficult. She was difficult to work with, um, ex- except for the fact of not having the house out of our hair. Right. Except for, except for the fact of not right. being done with it, I'm grateful. Um, and the offer we had from her, we were going to have to borrow twenty five thousand dollars in cash to, to make close. that to close. Yeah. In other words, to to we owe about eighty eight thousand dollars on the house that it was originally yeah. one hundred twenty eight. Mm-hmm. So literally, we've paid forty thousand dollars off the mortgage. Yep, and we can't sell it without taking out a huge loan to make up the difference for the sale. Because I mean, we'll have to, you have to pay off the mortgage Which plus all the fees please. associated with selling a few yeah. thousand. A few, yeah, seven thousand right. dollars. And the only, the so, only other offers we've gotten were for like crazy sixty little balls, like sixty. And yeah. we can't even borrow enough to close that sale. To close that gap, right? I mean, so um, and and if we did a short sale, yeah, for sixty thousand dollars, we may as well just hand the bank back. It has the same effect on our credit right. as just handing back the keys. So we haven't really talked about what it was like for the year and a half that I was away from the family and the the lasting sort of harm that did to everyone's. Well being, yeah. But that's that was a real thing. Having, that was a real thing. Yeah. Having dad gone half more than half the week sometimes. Yeah, I I feel like Benjamin only now really knows who you are. Uh, yeah, because the youngest kids really missed out. Yeah, and right. when he, I was home, mm-hmm. it was just on the weekend. It was always just trying to play catch up and helping you with everything, clean everything up. Just finally like, get back to zero. Yeah, from everything that's fallen behind during the week. Um. um and then yeah we the the what we went through moving just after having a the newborn a new baby oh that was hell <laughs> was <laughs> we were was desperately awful. trying to complete the move yeah and be ensconced in the new house house before the baby before the, idea was the birth the, we were going to move have the baby and put the house in the market Instead, we put the house in the market. Yes. We moved. No, yes. no, we put the house in the market. We had the baby and then we moved. Right. So, yeah. And this baby was a C-section. She yep. was special needs. She yep. was... It, tiny, tiny, tiny. And early. Early, yeah. premature, and had to have open heart surgery a few and months later. A few months later, yeah. And... This all, we should not lose track of the fact that this has been an incredibly stressful few years. Just. Uh, is this five years now? Because I think this, it was, yeah, it was March of 2013 when you lost your job. So yeah. this is, this is five years on. Yeah. And it kind of hasn't let up. I mean, we've had some it, reprieves. We've really had some reprieves. I have yet to have a vacation. In that five years, yeah. yeah. We've we've gone to visit your friend Amy. We went to her cabin like for overnights. For overnight. Like that's my that's, vacation. That's Summer been your vacation vacations. has been like two days. Two days. 
That's the best we've managed. In the last five years, yeah. In five years. Yeah. And all my paid time off has gone towards moving the baby's medical stuff, yeah. your medical stuff, yeah. the births, the, uh, the and, and just whatnot, and right. just like house-related stuff. All this yeah. chaff. Well, it's not so really chaff, but you know. I am really deeply burned out and stressed, mm -hmm. and you were burned out and stressed, and we yeah. are just hoping. We only have... You know, like I said yesterday, hope is a discipline. It's a discipline. We are living in hope that um, that this seller falling or this buyer falling through will have a silver lining, and that we'll find a buyer. when we finish the contract work and clean up, we'll put the house back on the market, market. in July, yeah. and within a month, we'll have a, a reliable buyer with an offer that we can live with. Yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe that's a good opportunity. You know, we, we'll see. That's what we're hoping for. And we can't really push it longer than that. We, no, not really. We've been um, paying two mortgages since we closed on the new house. Yep. And two sets of utilities. Yep. And we've learned the hard way that um, not being there means the property is deteriorating. Yeah. And, and, and to be fair... We knew that. Yes. We like knew that would happen. Like we knew that intellectually. We didn't want to turn off the heat. Right. The heat turned off. <laughs> right. <laughs> For stuff work. And just all, you know, a house that's not lived in, um, living in the house actually helps the house to remain functional. Yeah. You're like even, constantly yeah. cleaning up little things, noticing things. L noticing and bits and bobs and, and catching things before they become a real problem. And we really did what we could. Like we had a housemate lined up, Tried or a house, not a housemate, a house, house sitter, sitter. Yeah. lined up to live there through the winter for free. Yep. Just for, like he was just gonna, like, to be paint there. Some things. Yeah, he was, he was going to do a little work. Yeah, a little right? bit of painting, yeah. But uh, then we hired a guy to uh, repair the basement door yeah. and a guy to drain the pipes. Same guy. When we had to, when when the furnace went out, our house sitter had to leave. Because we didn't have a furnace. There was literally yeah. not a working furnace. Right. We had to, so we hired a guy to drain the pipes. We paid yep. him, he cashed the check, he never showed up. Never drained the pipes. Same thing with the basement door. This is just a really typical pattern for the people we've hired in Saginaw, yeah. right? Yeah, was, and his yeah. failure to actually do what he said he did meant that a pipe burst in the upstairs, yeah. which led to a huge insurance, insurance claim job. and a huge mold problem. Yep. Yeah. And we're still getting that cleaned up. Still working on. Yeah, we're wrapping all that up. And then, sort of like like the the icing, um, was the bat infestation. Yeah, the bat infestation. <laughs> all right. So the bats living in the attic. Yeah, and they somehow they knocked out an attic vent panel. The vent panel. Um, they were living in the insulation in the attic. Right. They were in the uh, ductwork, the heating system. Yeah. And we know because we found some in the filter of the furnace. A dead, burnt up bat in yeah. the furnace. In the furnace. Which probably was the cause of reducing the airflow enough that the furnace overheated yeah. and cracked the its heat, heat exchanger. Heat Right, which is why we didn't have a furnace to keep the house sitter through the winter. Right, so it's just this, it's been this progression of things. Right. And just recently we were very demoralized because the day after this um, seller, or just, I keep saying seller, the day this after the buyer, buyer backed out, out, we heard, we, we you were up there and you found that... Um, something. Something had smashed up uh, part of the big stone wall the big not, not a dry stone wall but a mortared stone a wall. mortared stone wall it's been there for 50 years or more that's been in front of the house for over 50 years and a bit large portion of it was knocked down yeah it wasn't a little accident sometimes like, kids would walk along the wall yep and they would like a stone would come loose stone would, stone they'd would come knock loose. out one stone or like they'd be walking or sitting and kind of rock it until it came right. you know and that that happened. Yeah, we had a few happened. loose stones, we would just but put this back. was smashed. Yeah, something smashed that wall, and it really looked like some it kind would of take vandalism. A sledgehammer. It looked like a, a deliberate act of vandalism. Yeah, and we're like, what more demoralizing? Right, you know, yeah, come on, right. But as it turns out, we finally did hear 
that actually one of the guys that does lawn work the lawn for service us company backed into it or something backed like into it that. like some kind of um, like a well, those trailer things trailer or not something. a trailer but the, those big skag mowers they have these huge like yeah. riding mowers like he backed into it with one of those big riding mowers well anyway he hit it hard enough to to knock down yeah. this big heavy stone wall yeah. and apparently was too embarrassed to tell his boss. boss and his boss found out and called me and said I'm sorry this happened we're remortaring it as we speak so they're so, going to fix that so that's that. at least something and because yeah. we were going to have to file a police report and another insurance claim and another insurance because <laughs> you know how I love insurance claims yeah. yeah and just to re-emphasize a little more this thing about how we can't even find people to, to do any kind of rational work, work for us right since we started working on these insurance claims oh my god four different field agents and desk <laughs> agents <laughs> have ghosted on us on, the, on like on this one claim on well, two claims. We've had we had two claims, but the all every adjuster that's ghosted us has been on the bat claim. Okay, uh, we had they just disappeared. They would just, just we would find out that they had left Liberty Mutual because their email started bouncing. Yeah, that's how we would find out. And they their cell would go dead, and then we'd finally have this to get, valid, get in touch with a supervisor, and eventually we'd hear, oh, this person's no longer with the company, or he's been reassigned to this guy. Or yeah, and or this ha- this is four people disappeared. Yeah, and um, we had this crazy estimate where oh my goodness! So like one of the first adjusters said to me, "Okay, so I re- I would recommend this company, <clears throat> and actually they very they, pardon me, they're very careful not to use that specific that phrase language. that language. They're not, not that he recommends to be partisan like that, right? Because they're not supposed to be partisan like that. But he said." This is a very good company. Mm-hmm. I've worked with them before. They can get this done well. Mm-hmm. Um, call blah blah blah, and have them put the estimate together. So the the and, work in the work in question was to clean out the attic insulation, like uh, um, remove the bats, disinfect everything, remove the, the bats, right. replace the insulation, replace the insulation, and clean the ductwork. And clean the ductwork. That was the work in question, right? Yeah. Right. The um, so a long time went by, and I checked yeah. in, and oh yeah, this one's going, and we're doing this. This is everything's fine every time I check in. Everything's fine. Right. Um, and then I can't get in touch with the adjuster. Right. And the adjuster who um gave me their name. Right. Who's and ghosted? Just ghosted. Doesn't answer text. Doesn't answer email. Just is gone. And finally, our real estate agent is like, so is this? Are these claims settled yet? I'm like, okay, the water claim is completely settled. Um, the work is still unfolding, but we've settled with the insurance company what they're going to pay for. Yeah. And then um, in the back claim, I'm thinking, you know, all the paperwork's in. It's got to be ready. I'm going to check tomorrow. Mm. So tomorrow, <clears throat> after that phone call where everything's yeah. fine, yeah. I get a call from the new adjuster. Yeah. And he says to me on the phone, have you seen this estimate? Yeah. And we're kind of like, yeah, you know, I... I think we've told this story before, but yeah, it, it's he can't it even. It goes t- with the house stories. So. Yeah, no, he, he he can't even say it on the phone. Yeah, and he says, "I'll just email that to you." Take a look at the estimate. Take a look. Just take a look, and so we get it, and it's like forty six thousand dollars to do the to clean out the bats, right? Uh, clear, you know, take out the insulation, disinfect everything, clean the ductwork, and re-insulate. Yeah, and we're kind of like, wow. We thought it would be. 10, 12,000 max. Tops. Tops, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Three, three guys working up there for, I mean, it's not pleasant, right? No, no, no. It's dirty work in a hot attic. Right. Uh, certainly, they deserve to, to be paid well for that. Sure. I, I wouldn't want to yeah. short them anything. Right. But so, the insurance agent's like, let's, what do you say about we get a That's more than most estimate? houses in Saginaw cost. Cost. Right. Seriously. So. He says, what do you say we get just get a second opinion on this? Because you know what? If the second <clears throat> opinion is like... Close. Close. We'll just you know, pay it. We'll just pay it. No, it's not an issue. Yeah. It's not about the number. It's about like, is this real? Yeah. Is, is this like actually... Makes what, sense. Makes sense. And so we get another estimate. But as soon as we start talking about another estimate, mm-hmm. that company just loses their shit. They start harassing our agent, our, our real, our real estate, estate agent. agent. Calling the, the insurance, insurance agent. Company. Right. 
Um, they're calling me. They're pressuring me to come, you know, start the work the next day. I mean, they just went like full, like a full court press. Yeah. As soon as like, oh, you want another estimate? Right. And um, and then, and they haven't said anything. They haven't sent me anything yet. Then they're like, well, you're gonna have to pay us for the work we've done. And they want like seventeen hundred, seventeen hundred dollars for their estimate. Right. They they were then when we said no, we're not gonna we're not gonna not go doing with this. you. And they said, well, yeah, the woman over the on the phone said you're gonna have to pay us for for the estimate, and she's saying you owe them seventeen hundred dollars for the estimate. And I said, send me an invoice for that. Send me an invoice detailing why we owe you seventeen hundred dollars. And which I you know what I, I would consider paying them for a day's work for doing the estimate. Straight up, like because well, it's work. Work is work. They well, had to drive there, you know, whatever, yeah, you know. But. Uh, this was news. To, well, first of all, it was news to me that contractors even do that, they right? Do that. Apparently, some do. Some do. They do some do. Sometimes, and they should get paid for their work. But, if it's especially if it's an elaborate estimate, right? right? But um, yeah, we've heard nothing. It's been three weeks. Three or weeks. So. Radio silence. Yeah. Um, so I'm waiting for the other shoe to fall with that company. But um, yeah. we moved on. It from seems that. like fraud. It seems like fraud. And especially it seems this- like something. Some kind of can. I don't. I shouldn't say things in a public uh, a document that's going public, but it does seem like something odd Fishy. was happening. Where between they, somehow between Liberty Mutual with all these agents just disappearing, and, and this, this contractor sort of, with this hugely inflated estimate, it, like, it just it just didn't seem right. Didn't seem right. Didn't make sense. And didn't add up. So this was and this was in that category of like, what the hell? What the how, hell? How do we like even get people to do this job? And mind you. I've got to say, this has been an anomaly with Liberty Mutual. Mm-hmm. We've had two other claims with them, smooth as glass. Yeah, like yeah. even when there were bumps in the road with like the work, that we we just it was there was no problem right. working through, right. getting it done, and coming to some kind of rational agreement. Yeah, so uh, not and it to... was one of these sort of ghosting adjusters who decided not to cover the furnace. Right. That somehow this was just right. normal wear and tear, that a 13-year-old furnace just cracks its heat exchanger. Yeah. Just happens. Which, I don't know, maybe, maybe. true, but maybe we, true. we don't know. We don't. Not I'm not a first guy. Not my area of expertise. expertise but, but that seems weird. And the truth is that we just don't have the money to repair the furnace. Repair the fr- and, and, or and really fight the insurance company about this? Or fight the insurance company. So there we are. Um, so it's been oh, quite. Oh, there's yeah. a there's a there's a delightful cherry on top of the thing. Yeah. Um, so the uh, the company that got the lower bid to do the oh, bat work <laughs> ghosted on us halfway through. <laughs> halfway through the job, we, we had to pay them up front. front. Now nobody they that we ins- talked to about bat work, like doing the right. cleaning the bats out, would do the job without full payment up front. Right. So this was not so actually... They insisted on right. full payment up front. And they all say, well, you should never pay a contractor all up front. You should pay them half and then make sure they right. give the rest. Which every other contractor do the job was doing. when you're satisfied. Right. right. Every other contractor was doing yeah. that. Yeah, right. But they, we had to pay them. So, you know, it was indirectly not our money. So we paid them. All right. The full amount. We got uh, most of it reimbursed from Liberty Mutual, although yep. we are out thousands of dollars in the, yep. all this stuff of our own money. Um, but they uh, started. They started, dis- disappeared, and then they disappeared, and they didn't tell you that they That's weren't done because it was supposed to be done. Yep. On a cer- by a certain day, they, and they didn't even go in the next day. But, and they and they didn't call me. They, they didn't, didn't tell me anything. You. The first I found out was when they called me to <clears> schedule <throat> the day they're coming back later in the month. Right. This week. This coming week. Yeah, this coming Monday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was weeks ago. It was supposed to be done. Right. That's weeks actually, I think, ago. probably today at this point. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, it's okay, long, long show. Now there's there's whipped cream on top of the cherry. Oh, under the cherry. Yeah. Under the cherry. Yeah. Which is that the so it seemed like okay at the very least we can work with this company that that we're hiring to do the duct clean out. Yep. Right. They oh, gave yeah. a so reasonable estimate. They're gonna come do it. it it was reimbursed by insurance without any trouble. Any trouble, any flag. We got paid for them to do it. Promptly. We just are ready to pay them. They showed up and took a look at the job and said, and said we can't do this. We won't do it. We won't do it. There's asbestos insulation on the joints. 
all the joints the work. in the ductwork has asbestos in it. And legally, actually legally, they can't touch it. They're not permitted. It. To. They're not allowed to touch it until the asbestos has been encapsulated or removed. Right. They could have told me this when they did the estimate. Right. They really could have mentioned that. No, they showed up to do the job. They showed up to do the job and they're like, oh, can't, no, can't do. Sorry. Right. Can't and we're out of luck. And we're just out of luck. And so we're asking Liberty Mutual, well, what, about what this, can you do about what, this, this so we can get the ducks cleaned out? And they're like, nothing. We will not, not they will not pay to remediate, to remediate the, asbestos. the asbestos. And um, and yes, yes. And we waited to have them come in after the mold was done, which was its own saga. Yeah. And at every fucking turn, yeah. oh my, every fucking turn, we would get a report of one thing happening, convey that report, and then it wouldn't happen. Yeah. For some reason, which... It would just fall apart. It would just fall apart. Ghost, disappear ghost. Fail whatever. to show up, not follow uh, you through. Know, and mind you, the uh, one thing that to me felt perfectly reasonable was the way the mold job got bigger and kind of like took longer. Yeah. That made sense. Right. They it, found they found more. They found more than they expected. In fact, this right. was part of the talk about how people lied about the house. Oh, gosh. When they tore the ceiling open, they found that the water leak we were treating, apparently there had been water leaks for decades. Decades. There were three ceilings. There were three ceilings because apparently every time like uh, the ceiling leak. started to get really stained from the like chronic water leaking into the ceiling... They would just put up another layer of drywall. Right, and just cover it. And it was kind of breathtaking. It's like, yeah. you, like wow, no, seriously, there's just yeah. three ceilings. No, it was like a foot lower than it was originally. <laughs> right? And you walk in and there's these high ceilings in that yeah. room. <laughs> it would have been even higher <laughs> right? without all these layers. Right. So um, so they, we, they discovered that, and um, Liberty Mutual okayed up to the maximum that we had for mold coverage, and yeah. we got so it. So the ceiling's getting all replaced. Oh, all replaced. It's it's happening, but that was like one of these unforeseeable things that happens when you're doing construct any kind of yeah. contracting work, right? Like finding the asbestos under the subfloor under the floor. In, yeah. the, in the family. Things room. like that happen. It's not weird. Everything else was just like conspiring to make us look bad. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. like every time okay this is happening that's not happening yeah. i mean even stuff that was stupid like oh the insurance company won't be paying us they'll be paying the contractors no they're sending us checks oh yeah well, and we, we they're told, paying contractors we told the buyer that we are that they would pay the contractors directly because that's how they did it before that's how they've done it in the past and mind you i think three or four of the contractors we've had this time they paid them directly some of them but right, others of, they just issued us a check, check. which is actually a big pain in the ass because it means they're mailing us a check. It takes five days to get here. We may have to pay them We're, before that happens. We may have to pay them before that happens. We're worried about the thing getting lost in the mail because some of these so. checks were sizable, right? Yep. And then I've got to deposit it and wait it's for it to clear, clear and then I've got to transfer it to, you know, the whatever. Probably account. On, just on and on, right? <clears throat> and then also, it's, and it's also not as clear cut as they're paying us or they're paying the contractors. Right. They're doing both. Right. So trying to account for everything is... It's just like this, yeah, ridiculous sort of situation. Yeah, especially if you factor in like this depreciation, all that strange accounting that going on. I can't on. even begin with that. Don't even start. But yeah, I, I can't explain it to you. They come up with how much they're going to cover. They agree to cover it. It's reasonable. They've got a right. contractor that's going to do the work for that. And then they pay us less. Less than that. <laughs> And we can get the balance after the work is done. Supposedly. Supposedly. So, you know, God bless them all. So we're, out, like I said, we're out th thousands, thousands of dollars, dollars between our deductibles and all the overages and differences and whatnot. And so on and on. The, the, it, this was two to three weeks of work. Yeah, it's taken two months. It's That's still taken not done. two months and it's still not done. Yeah. So... Yeah, and it was really like, okay, it's take two, three weeks, pad that, because it was straightforward and we had everyone lined up. And so much of the work itself is because of other people's failures. But, so there it is. So um, so any any um, ideas that I'd had or, been or were entertaining about being a landlord has gone straight to hell. Yeah, no, we were thinking about that for a while. If we couldn't sell the house, let's turn it into rental housing. And, and, and you know. Or maybe do something like that. And, you know, we could be, I know most landlords are assholes, but we could be benign landlords, right? It's like, 
Yeah, fuck that. No, we can't even, for that neighborhood also, we can't even charge enough to cover our mortgage cover because our cost. rental homes don't go for that much in no. Saginaw. No, no, no. Right? We, we couldn't even cover our costs. And if we try and rent this place to, you know, a, a, an indigent family or something and they discover that, oh, yeah, it's going to cost $800 to heat the house to 63 degrees in the winter. Yeah, they'll, they'll go as fast. That's yeah. not going to fly. fly. It's not going to work. So... You know, uh, so there's that. It's a. Uh, um, it all didn't work. I, it all I, it all didn't work. It's a. We call it our our failure in the Saginaw. But you know, all of these things are the results of decades of policy and decisions. They and were completely outside of us. A lot of it, almost entirely. Not all of it, but like a lot of it, including the fact that like. Um, American companies yeah. made bank for decades oh, on yeah. lead mm-hmm. and asbestos. Yeah. Right? And never paid for the liability associated and the with... They... And the damage they inflicted on these communities for profit. Widespread damage. And nobody along the way has ever made decent policy to really... To back that up, get to try, to rid back, of this problem. Yeah, walk that back, to, and get to rid really of the get rid of the problem, in a way that other countries have solved. Right. right. So what you're left with are these houses that have lead, and they have asbestos, and insurance won't cover it, and this won't cover it, and that won't happen, and and you can't sell it. You can't sell it. You have to disclose it, and so all that burden of that toxic material, toxic time bomb, falls to the owner. Falls to the owner. Right. Um. And um, you will either remediate it or hide it. Yeah. Right. And guess I mean, what like, most people do. They hide it. And honestly, um, we just took care of the asbestos we found. Yeah. Right? Um, but at this point, we can't. we really can't put any more money into the house. We can't put any more money into the house. We don't have it. We don't, we don't have it. We've, it just doesn't make uh, any more Over the last sense? 18 months almost of, uh, of paying two mortgages, mm-hmm. we have gradually uh, spent each month on average slightly more than I take home. Yeah. And which not means, like extravagance, but slightly. Which means that we've racked up our credit cards and... Um, there's not much left. We don't have much wiggle room left. No. We're getting to the end of our rope. For taking this house along. Yeah. So there's that. <clears throat> and I don't know. What would how much would we need to to carry on it? How much more would we need to carry on that house indefinitely? What would it take? Two thousand? What is I don't I don't know what you mean. Oh so, per month? Yeah, per month. Oh. We'd need another 2000 a month to carry that house. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Because for one thing, we've got to replace the furnace. Yeah. And then, what, are we going to be traveling up there every week to, to inspect, inspect it? it and, and make, yeah. And, no, what? it, it needs to have someone living in it. Someone has to live there. Someone has to live there. Yeah. Full stop. So. Yeah. And it can't really be us anymore. No, no. And. Like this whole story, I think if we've tried to convey nothing else, it's that we really did our best to. We tried to live in Saginaw. We tried, and I should point out that aside from all the other like big plan ideas, mm-hmm. we were moving in large part to be near your family. That was a big part. Yeah, my uh, there's the, some of you may not know this sort of backstory. Um, uh, so my parents are longtime community activists and civil rights workers and whatnot. Go figure. Uh, you know, what are the odds, right? Yeah. And uh, in retirement, and and, and there's, there's, there's all, as with all stories, there's more than a lot more to the story. Not quite as romantic as it sounds, but in retirement, they bought an old house for cash on the east side and started doing freedom summers. So like mm-hmm. if, you, if you know what Freedom Summer was, they mm-hmm. started doing Freedom Summers and educating neighborhood children on their various civil rights, on 
language and, and yeah. uh, gardening and also like practical skills and intellectual skills. Mm -hmm. And they held classes. And I, I think I taught a history class uh, with them. And um, and my, my parents did the gardening. They're much They're more huge expensive. gardeners. They had huge. They were huge gardeners. Yeah. And um, started fixing up houses in the neighborhood. And they were hoping to build a whole like literally rebuild a whole neighborhood and get people to move there, you know? Yeah. It was yeah. not cr that crazy. Wasn't that crazy? The houses were dirt cheap and there were people still there. And, you know, there was, um, there was, they saw the opportunity. Yeah. And also, they also really <clears throat> felt a deep commitment to giving back to communities that were In marginalized. Trouble. Yeah. Yeah. To, to any marginalized community, they felt a deep commitment to being yeah. present because they had and giving back managed to, to do. Do well, well to do well in in spite of everything. While doing good, right? You know. And um, uh, so they were already there and had been there since 1998. And my father passed in 2007, mm -hmm. and my mother's health health had has not been good for some time. Yeah. And my brothers, I had three brothers living there. Mm -hmm. One had gone off to grad school, one had gotten married, and one was still there providing her daily care. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to be present with him, if not to take over the care, just to give him some respite, because yeah. it was really taking a huge toll on him. And we wanted our kids to, to grow up to get to know their grandmother as best yeah. they could for as long as they could, as best they could for as long as they because could. Because my mother is is past right. is dead. Um, that was their other grandmother, and my father's my, past. Your father's past, and my. Uh, father lives in california yeah and we don't see him very much and it's not that practical to get out there with a big family and, and or we, we just don't have this sort of like right um vibrant relationship right like this daily interaction no. relationship right and so we really jumped at the chance in part to, to have the to children have the, ch the kids able to to get to know their grandmother and spend time with her and like day to day Week to week, like and literally, and and you know what, we succeeded at that. We did. That was success because every week they spent at least one afternoon and sometimes several afternoons yes. a week with their grandmother. With their grandmother, it was an absolute treasure. Yeah. Um, three and of them. So three of them remember it vividly. Three of three of them were old enough to remember her well. Right. And so in that regard, we succeeded, we succeeded in doing what we set out to do. Mm -hmm. It's just. That if you count all, all the, the, the cost and all the losses and all the failures against that success, it's hard to feel successful. It's really hard to feel, even though it was a great success. Yeah. And she had, if someone can have a good death, she did. Yes. Um, but it's still hard to feel successful about that. Right. In 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 the balance. Right. But I, I'm very glad and grateful that the kids did get a chance to spend time with her grandmother. Right. And we might, I think we would do things differently, but we would, would probably do it again. We would still, I think, even knowing everything. That we know. We would choose a different house. We might choose a different neighborhood. We might do things quite differently. Really? But I but think we'd do it we again. We would try to do that part of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But then after, after she passed, we would have left. Right. Sooner, sooner before we were so broken <laughs> so bro not just broke but broken yeah right. no broken like spiritually and exhausted right. well and, and, and like for me i really can't count it's having neighbors again i mean unless it's like a close a, neighbors a black, like close neighbors unless it's a black or hispanic neighborhood yeah um and even then i'm not sure yeah i, I actually want people to be afraid to bully us and that's yeah. not true of white liberals Right, no, no. And um, no, they really feel like it's their, their job to, their yeah, duty to. Their job. And Justified so, in all kinds of ways. So I, in my adult life, I have never lived more than walking distance from my church. In my adult life. This is something else we lost in Saginaw while we lived there that we didn't mention, yeah. which was we were in walking distance of St. Stephen's Church. Our neighborhood church. Our neighborhood Catholic church, and we went there. We walked yeah. there. We still managed to be late a lot of times, even walking. Right. <laughs> but right. we did. Mm -hmm. And then for a while, for for one, um, we both um, Sam and Joshua, 
We're at their, like, they had a Montessori preschool. We're going to a Montessori preschool there, and I would walk them there yeah. in the morning. It was really nice. It was lovely. It was yeah. walkable. It was a cool thing. It was um, a good thing. And then that parish closed. The school closed, the parish closed and merged. There are still masses there. Yeah. It has a new name. It's been merged with another parish. But the school is closed. The school is gone. And the character... And the, the character and the community are, are gone. So. It's gone. It's and just that gone. was another thing And that's that, when they like kind of turned on us, got really weird. That was another thing that where they turned on us. They started to distrust us. Everything we tried to do there, they thought we were trying to run some kind of a con or scam. Right. They would... Like our... Veronica... Our oldest daughter and a friend of hers were doing. <laughs> they were having bake sales. Yes. To raise money f- for disabled orphans. Literally. Literally, they were literally two eleven-year-old girls raising money for disabled orphans. Yeah. And they were like. They wanted to sell cookies at the. At after the mass. mass. After mass. After yeah. mass, right? And they're like, "We can't do that. How do we know this isn't a scam?" I'm like, "You've." <laughs> Why would you jump to that conclusion conclusion? when these two girls are here to... (laughs) I mean, you just... just, So what if it is a scam? So what if it is a scam, (laughs) right? right? We're going to make $25 and scam people for cookies that they got. Yeah, right. Okay. But seriously, you just confirmed this girl and gave her her first communion. She's... uh, Like you just catechized her. her. She's got a mass mass here every... She was four years old. Most of her life. Right? And... And you're the, you've been the people catechizing her, and you think she's running a con on you. Right. Seriously? No. I'm just asking. Uh, and by contrast... White liberals, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, to people, like, why am I have such an issue with white liberals? I, I've... Okay, I know some that I like. Yes. You know, uh, you know some of my best friends are white liberals. Right, <laughs> right. But there is but this it's sort bullshit of problem. Like this. It's just I mean, it's rank n- bullshit. Never... Can, and it's always slippery. You can never call them out and say, that's racist, yo. And like, what the hell? Because like, how could that be, be racist? I mean, we just don't, you know, no, want really, to participate in a con. I really wanted to get this t-shirt. That I, should, I should still get one. It says, how is that racist? Question mark. How is that racist? And uh, the little uh, underneath, it says, white proverb. <laughs> <laughs> white proverb. <laughs> um, <coughs> the... Um, and it just in contrast, when Veronica's friend went to her parish and said, can we have a bake sale? Yeah. They were like, oh my, could they you? They were excited that some they were kids thrilled. in the parish were doing something. We're doing something. Because most of them are just on their iPads, you know? Right. And they showed up and they turned out, gave them all kinds of money for their disabled orphans. Yeah. <laughs> right? And then when we asked, uh, in contrast, at, we went to the east side and asked. At, um, at the cathedral. At the cathedral. Right. They were only too happy to have us for all their masses. Oh, come after every mass. Yeah. It'll be great. We'd love to have you. Yeah. How wonderful they for were you to do this. They were very welcoming. Very welcoming, very supportive. And not like, like they knew us. They'd seen us come to mass right. there. Right, We weren't registered there. No. They and just we, recognized we us and said, oh, much yeah. Much less often. Right. right. Oh, yeah, just, just go ahead. But even from being there occasionally, they were welcoming. Welcoming and yeah. happy to have us and have these children put on a bake sale. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, do some charity work. Yeah. So that um, that's just it confirms that, you know, we did consider trying to buy a dilapidated house in the cathedral district and fix it up. So but, closely. But yeah. I just, I really needed to be able to move into a place where I could do my job. Right. Off the bat. Day and one. continue to do my job day one. And Without, with And right. with a house full of kids... It couldn't be a lead and asbestos we were, filled construction project. Project, right? We were afraid from of lead and asbestos. Right. We were afraid of lead and asbestos, and you know, construction work, right? And, very and small also, problems, we, we wouldn't have had the money to, to renovate really a house. renovate it like that. Well, no, we had one small job replacing a floor, yes. which ballooned into tens right. of—I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars, months and months of yeah, work. Yeah. Yeah. And it was confined to the opposite end of the house, so opposite end of the house, so it didn't right. actually destroy. But our it was lives. crazy. It took it was half crazy. the summer. Yeah. It actually it wasn't done until November. Yeah, we were eating on the kitchen floor right. until November. Right. Um, and like eating it oh, upstairs. I about like, that. Yeah, yeah, it was just yeah. ridiculous. No, so and and we didn't want honestly the strain on our marriage. Like 
moving and trying to actually renovate a house and live in it and work from it and, and raise five kids in it. As many skills as we have, neither of us are that handy. We're not actually that handy. That I'm handy. not I'm very very much hardly handy at all with as far right. as house so, stuff. I right. can I can design you some amazing embedded firmware, you know. And you'll and build even, a radio, yeah. Even, you know, solder together a prototype. But But yeah, not so much the, you know, framing. Yeah. So it wasn't really like we were these this plucky young couple that would no. build it out or do the work ourselves. No, and in the we evenings. had a family already. And, right. You know. So, but we considered long and hard. Yeah. Living in that neighborhood. In but one of those in, in retrospect, again, doing it again, we should have moved into the cathedral district if possible somewhere. Yeah. yeah, that would have been a really good fit for us. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So, all that said. Um, Because ultimately, uh, there was some bullshit last straw with that parish. That may have been it. I don't remember. When they accused a couple of 11-year-old girls of running a con. Running a scam by wanting to have a bake sale. um, That that may have been the last straw. Something was. Um, And we ended up moving to the cathedral as our parish. Eleanor was baptized there. Yeah. Um, And it was a good fit. Yeah. You know? All that said... um, so many mistakes we made um, were really just naivety, like a yeah. like a deep kind of naivety about um, the way things are, yeah. and the way things work, and so like we're talking about this sort of being broken and spiritually broken. Yeah, I don't feel comfortable living in a neighborhood anymore. Yeah, especially because even I'd grown used to basically being under a certain kind of house arrest in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was the way it is, you know. I just kind of took that as as a given for people who were like for renters or something for like mm-hmm. a certain right, right, right. Yeah, and, when we rented, it was just constant low level discrimination against renters, and even some things have changed. But at the time, like we literally couldn't send Isaac to the school that was down the block. Right. No, you the, know, he had to it go wasn't to the allowed. He, he had to be uh, he had to be bused to the poor kids' school like a mile away, a couple miles oh, couple, away, yeah, like five miles away. Yeah, because was, that's yeah. where where renters were allowed to go, and they from our neighborhood. Yeah, they've since changed this. Right, but it was actually there was like a line around all the rental property. Right, but and no, then, it was yeah. somehow like it was zoned or district in this way. Right, and this is white liberal, you know, property owners at work. Yeah. Right. Yeah protecting their property, property values, values and, and their protecting schools. their access to their, their school good districts. schools and keeping poor kids, that is black kids, Low out scores. of their good schools because you wouldn't want to bring down their Their test scores funding. or anything, their funding. So, That's no child left behind in, in, in action. In action. Leaving our child behind. George, you're leaving your child behind. So, the, um, so yeah, so I, I'd kind of come accustomed to that and... Yeah. Well, so, yeah, just used um, to it. Used to it, and had this idea that that would Felt change. Like you could navigate around. Like it. I could navigate around it, and like that would change if we, you know, bought a house, etc. Um, and it didn't. It actually got worse. Yeah. Now, mind you, yeah. I think if we, in retrospect, I'm. It's pretty clear to me now that had we bought a house in Ann Arbor, the viciousness wouldn't have taken three years. That would have been like three weeks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Before people were just like openly hostile and vicious, right? Trying for, to drive us out for like, like even s- organizing, to like drive surreally us out. crazy reasons. Yeah, like your children are walking barefoot in their yard. Right, right. Crazy. Okay, so that um, that was a thing. By that was the way. a thing. That was yeah. an actual complaint. An actual complaint. They kids <laughs> walking barefoot in their own yard. Um, and like the. And I remember in hushed tones, the neighborhood watch president's like, I have to talk to you about your kids. I was like, oh, no, were they like in someone's yard? Were they vandalizing someone's property? Like, no, they were barefoot in the yard. What? Seriously? <laughs> Is this a serious conversation? It's like nobody remembers their childhoods. Like their own childhoods. Because these right? aren't young people. <laughs> these are not 30-year-olds. Not They're olds. our age and older. Yeah, yeah. They so, should, and they remember, if you talk to them, they remember their they childhoods. They remember their free doing those childhoods. things. Right. But no, it all goes out the fucking window right. for the black kids. So, um, so we're at the point now where I, I, don't, I just, I'm not interested in your cute neighborhood anymore. Yeah. It just looks like a hellhole. I'm not, yeah, thanks now. 
Yeah. And and seriously, there was no way. It's all, it's just this. It's also just this long term feeling that for a biracial couple, for a mixed um, religious couple, for a weird weirdo conservative, you know, homeschooling from home, homeschoolers, there's just not a place for us. Yeah. Just not really. Uh, that's that's if uh, yeah. I mean, just not really. There just really isn't a place. No. Um, and so now we live in, you know, this is not to begrudge our home. Yeah. It's a beautiful home. You have a beautiful yard. It's very nice. It's not really where we wanted to be. But it's no place. Yeah. It's not a neighborhood. It's it's not a city. It's not a... So it is very much it's not utopia. A town. Yeah. It, it's, it's just this random uh, allotment of land on... It is literally a leftover allotment of land when they were laying yeah. out county lines. And, Precisely. And it's outside of Ypsilanti School District, which means that if we want to go to the nearest library... It's not the library that's literally a mile and a half away. It's the it's library. It's in the next county. It's in the next county. It's ten miles away. Yep. So like, and the, so the, the yeah. public school that the kids would be assigned to if we sent them to a public school from here is ten, 10 miles, miles away. away on a bus. Yeah. And, and so it's this weird no man's land. I mean, like I was saying, it's literally utopia. Yeah. There's no place. No. We, and it's a lovely spot in the woods, you know. Yes, the house is lovely. It's been it's been a joy to live here. It feels like we're always at a vacation home, you yeah. know. And we can go out on our deck and enjoy a wonderful, uh, peaceful evening in the woods. Yes, and, that's and the terrific. children can run around and play and make yeah. a lot of noise. Yeah, and and you know, be children. And so far, they haven't gotten very much harassment, except when they strayed into their neighbors' yards. Yeah, that wasn't okay. Yeah. Um, which, you know, was not okay for me growing up. Right. Right? But now we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we keep the neighbor's dog from shitting all over our yard? Because he's got a new dog that apparently he thinks it's completely okay to let roam. And when we have gone over, when you've gone over to complain, he doesn't even seem to understand the complaint. Like, like keep your dog out of our yard, please. Yeah, like, like oh, oh, she's a wonderful dog. She's a wonderful dog. She'd never bite him. No, the kids are afraid of your dog. I'm afraid your dog's going to a- attack my kids. Particularly my infant. Uh, yeah. Or shit all over our lawn. Or N- both. Or both. <laughs> you know. So, keep your dog out of my yard. But it just seems like, you Whatever. Know. And he's perfectly content to say, can your kids keep their toys out of the driveway? Which, yeah, you know, right. they is should. a reasonable, they should. They should keep their toys out of the driveway. It's a shared driveway. And he should keep his dog out of our yard. I'm just saying. I'm going to have to, so I got to go speak to this gentleman. Um, so yeah, we still have neighbors. Potentially provoke a crisis. Even though we're on this huge lot way back in the, in the woods of at nowhere. the end of a long drive, right. we still have neighbors. We still have neighbors. There's no avoiding that entirely. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so yeah, we've moved to this no man's place where we're in this township with a mailing, uh, one city's mailing address and a different city's school system. <laughs> And not actually part of any of those places right, right. in any material way, and except on paper. And we can't, we haven't really found a good church home. No, they're all far away. They're all far away. And, and now mind you, St. John the Baptist is the one I like the best. Yeah, we were uh, there today. We were there today. And, you know, and I'm always reminded when we go there that, you know, it, it's not the worst thing that ever happened to us. Right? No, it's, it's a fairly nice parish. It's a nice parish. It, we don't really feel plugged in or connected. No. So, uh, we need to solve that problem somehow, but I don't know how. And part yeah. of it is, I've always been in this mind where, you know, you move near a church and then you go there. Right. That's how it works. Right. That's what I've always done. So, I'm a little bit um, stymied. I don't know quite why I cross this territory. Yeah, I don't really know how to make it work. Yeah. <clears throat> I know. I'm so, sorry about that. we'll start that. figuring that out. We'll see how it goes. We deliberately passed up several houses that were in our price range in Tony neighborhoods actually. that were in fancy neighborhoods yeah some pretty Tony places and they were actually nicer houses even oh you know yeah one of them was one of them was amazing it was amazing yeah but um we but just were just know. certain enough about what life among neighbors, neighbors like close neighbors like that is like well, would and, be like 
I was even giving that one serious thought, except there was an H away. <laughs> oh yeah, that's and that was also that became a deal breaker for deal us. Break, it's no, no H away, and they would not allow you to build a fence. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you couldn't even hide your uh, kids from harassment. Right. I couldn't even hide the kids from harassment. So they could like just just stay inside the fenced yard, guys. You know, jump on your trampoline, and dig your holes inside the fenced yard. Not a problem. Yeah. No, no, not even that. Not allowed. Not allowed. Um, so, as great as the house was, that was a no go. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I it's, it's it's kind of sad because every now and then I'm like, yeah, that could have been nice. Yeah, maybe not. So I, I do have a, you know, things have settled down kind of with our neighbors. We're not having very many interactions with them aside from this thing with the dog. Yeah. And one of our neighbors seems friendly and, you know, keeps trying to be friends with us. And right, he's right. he's really done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. We're he's, just he's really just like, skittish. Like, I don't know, you so know, why are you coming to our house again? Right. We're just really skittish. Right. But I, I want to comment on something that happened early on that I griped about on Facebook. Which oh, was, God, yeah. Which was that um, for a, when... Um, he had some work done on the driveway. Yes. The guy that shares the driveway with us. Yeah. He had the like first, I don't know, 40 yards of the, the ro- of the driveway paved. like repaved and right. re-asphalted. And it was blocked off. Right. So you couldn't right? drive in and out. You couldn't drive in and out. Meanwhile, there is another drive of, of a few doors down. There's a, cu- like, there's a, like a cut through, a utility cut through. There's a utility cut through that and runs at an angle. Perpendicular to, to the driveway. Perpendicular to the driveway, and it's a, it's a um, what is what's the word, affordance or a, um. Well, it's, you, what's the word when you have access to something you don't easement. own? It's an easement owned by the utility, utility company. companies. Right. They have to have access to it because their power lines run, run through, through there. Right. And so they mow it and whatnot. And like every few years they come through and take down everything. Take down all up. the brush and all right. that. It's just part of their routine maintenance thing. Right. Well, so you could go up this other drive. Cut through the easement. Cut and get to through our driveway. the easement and get to our driveway. And there's like several driveways like <clears throat> that run through perpendicular to the easement. One of our neighbors decided that he didn't like, you know, the people actually driving through the easement because he considered it part of his yard. Which legally it probably is. It probably is. And, you know, I guess he's probably not required to let non-utility vehicles drive through it. Right. But our driveway was blocked off. There's literally no other way for us to get to our home and, or out to work. And he decided to start putting up signs saying no trespassing, private property. And, like, if I wanted to go to work... I literally had no choice but to drive over the signs. Yeah. Like, and the, the other neighbors did too. We we're like looking at each other like, seriously? So the house so we, Well, we just drive through it, right? Right. And then he escalated it. Yeah. And he actually built a... Like a, what do you call it? An embankment? Yeah. A fortified it was, embankment? It was what you would see in a trench warfare situation right. in world war one or the revolutionary war where you literally throw up uh, like a tree fit. branches right. like a whole tree right. a whole dead pine tree with sharpened branches like two two or three of them stacked Bl- blocking the easement so that like if you tried to walk through there you'd puncture yourself on all these sharpened pine branches. Yeah. It was literally like like he had dug a trench and there was a machine gun nest back there. Right. It was surreal. It was uh, you call it surreal, I call it psychotic. <laughs> well, no, I was just having a hard time like I was like actually imagining trenches and I'm like Really? Is it full? Of, like, is this mind? Is this, Are like, there caltrops no, that I, am I going to puncture my tires? Well, yeah, what's happening here? I'm just trying to get to work and back, and this whole thing is going to be done in, in like another 48 hours. hours. It'll be dry, and we can right. drive on it. Like this, this wasn't like a three week thing. No, this was like all happened over like a three day period. A three day period. <laughs> like over the course of three days, a few of his neighbors are going to drive through the easement to get in and out from their homes. So it's really this sort of, so yes, it's this isolated space, but it's really this, you know, you stay in your yard, you stay on your driveway, you know. Yeah. It's not going to be a problem. Now, uh, Americans in general, and white Americans in particular, 
get psychotic about their property rights. And mm-hmm. e- that even under like a common duress, they can't share, you right. know. Right. And man, I. <laughs> This was pretty basic. This was not like This any... was pretty basic. It wasn't like we had a lot of options. And like right? he didn't have to do anything. No. Like like he did like he could just like sit in his house. All he had to do was tolerate this for two or three days. And the thing is, the guy doing the the uh work who right. was blocking this driveway talked to him about it. He knew it was coming, he, he knew, knew it, was, it com- was happening. And he knew that people were going to need to drive through this easement. And now, mind you, this is the guy who doesn't understand that his dog shouldn't be in our yard. Like <sighs> his his take from the conversation with this guy about using the easement was like, "Oh, it's fine. That's fine." I he, to him. he told us the neighbor with the dog, the neighbor that did the work on the driveway. He told us, "Oh, it's fine." Uh, he, he's, I talked to the guy. We can just drive through the easement. He says we can just drive through the easement and use the use the, the side the other side driveway. It wasn't even his driveway. No. Like it's just the easement crosses like right, his. Right, was land. using someone else's driveway to get onto the easement to drive right. to our driveway. It was like this work around, you know. Right. But For it got three cra- days. But it was crazy. It it was just so, like, crazy, so I posted a rant about you know like fucking neighbors again, like yeah, and I just reminded of William S. Burroughs referred to. The, in one of his essays, he divided the world into two kinds of people. Mm-hmm. There are good neighbors and there are shits. Yeah. And good neighbors are the people who basically will be like, if you're not actually harming me or inconveniencing me, I will basically it's live and let live. Yeah, do what you got to do. And the shits are the people who will go out of your their way to bust you. Like, like yeah. To, to do you get, have a permit for that? I'm just who, asking, who do you have a permit for that? you or call CPS Is that or legal call here? whatever. And that was also that was another experience we had with our neighbors is the fucking fire pit thing, you know, where we knew the fire chief, we met the fire chief, and I had a neighbor harassing us and about toasting marshmallows in in our yard. This was in Saginaw. This was in Saginaw, but it's just like, like seriously, we we can't toast marshmallows in our backyard. Okay. Yeah, and I kind of lost it with her, and I still feel badly that I. I Lost started cursing, at, cursing her out. Well, it was kind of fucking crazy, because you know this is what's funny. This is the funny part. Before we toasted marshmallows in their, our backyard, yeah, I checked the city ordinance to make sure it was legal. Right, and she's got actually printouts of city ordinances. She's and waving like, in our faces. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, give it here. I'll show you where it says we can do this. Please call the fire marshal right now. He was just over installing the smoke detectors this, a couple days ago. A couple ago. days ago. Yeah. And this was not an issue for the fire department for us to toast right. marshmallows in the backyard. Right. Um, but no, she's actually in our yard shouting us down about her son's asthma and how, what, how dangerous this was. And seriously, I now mind you, I was a silver scout, okay? <laughs> So I checked the ordinance before I lit a fire inside right. the city limits. Right. And I had a bucket right. of water right. before I lit a fire inside the city limits. Right. And I've got a whole table organized and everyone's been trained on fire safety. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> so if there's anyone who's going to start a fire, they weren't near me. Yeah. <laughs> but she's having some kind of conniption fit because... We're getting away with something. And that's that's really often it. And again, it's it's the people who have nothing, who can't stand the idea that you might be getting something they don't have or getting away well, and, with something. And it wasn't even like anything that I mean. Literally, we're sitting yeah, in I the know. grass toasting marshmallows. Right. And it's yeah. like after it was also it was like after we've lost every opportunity to travel or do trips or go to beaches or have vacations or whatnot. Finally, right. we're like reduced to. Okay, we're just going to do a tiny little camp out in our own backyard, and and, and you know we're we're everything's gone wrong for us. We're absolutely fucking miserable. We're just like, but hey, you know let's what? have a little. We'll have a little camp out in our own backyard. backyard. And she had to like shit come on shit that. on it. Come shit on it. Yeah. It was just white liberal breathtaking. neighbors. I'm telling, I know, you. telling you. Anyway, every day of the week. Um, so we should we should figure out a way to wind this up somehow and stop bitching and moaning because stop it's kvetching. still feels it's all this has been this has been nine years of our lives it's a all significant told? the whole hey, Saginaw yeah, yeah. adventure to now yeah and because it's 2010 
So yeah, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Eight, yeah, yeah. We're in year nine. We're in year nine. Of this adventure. And nine years is a significant portion of our lives. Lives. And it's... The entire life of several of our children. Of several of our children. Right. Yeah. And (sighs) we're still not settled. Still not settled and still not... And it's still not... We still haven't gotten ourselves back together. And more importantly, like, we still don't have a sense of security anywhere. Yeah. No, not really. And that's what's really, like, eating me and it's making our kids kind of crazy, I think, is that... That lack of security. Is that the feeling that if they fuck anything up, even small, that even it could slightly. bring hellfire down. The whole thing down. comes down. It's hellfire and brimstone. But it's yeah. because Grace and I feel that way. Right. So, yeah. Right, so, you know. We need to have robust supported communities that are anti-fragile and instead we're like again feeling like it's all hanging by a single all paycheck yeah, yeah. so i think that's where we are that's where we are and that's where we've been yeah and it's not did not go quite the way we hoped no there were some real sterling successes yep but it was not what we'd hoped for yep and um yeah it's too bad. If you know anyone who uh, is moving to or lives near or in Saginaw, oh, Michigan, Michigan, and is interested in getting an amazing deal on a 1928, 3,600 square feet home, that's we can hook you up. That's undergoing renovations even as we speak. We could really we could hook you up. We could hook you up. So yeah, get in touch. We can only lose so much money on it, but we'll do our best. Do our best. To screw over our neighbor's property values. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if oh, you're goodness. poor or people of color or loud or otherwise annoying to white liberals, give us a call. Give us a call. We'll give <laughs> you a discount. A discount. Oh, I wouldn't want any marginalized person in that position. No, we don't want to We don't want to make Not things really. worse for right. someone, right. which Not we really. certainly did for ourselves. Yeah. And the thing is, yeah. like like Orwell, uh, we were free know, to leave at, at, any at time. The, at the start of this, at the start of this situation, he was free to leave. But after he stayed long enough, he wasn't really he free. was no longer free to leave because right. <laughs> he, he was, was in too deep. He was in too deep. And that's right. what happened to us. Right. And I think even um yes and no, right? We were like sort of behind the eight ball and all that. Yeah. But we did have this thing where we were like actively not looking at jobs in outside the area. The idea of of moving, well, the idea of being able to buy a house again, right, and moving again, just seemed unbelievably daunting. Unbelievably daunting, and we were try we were actively trying to stay. And the only and also the only reason we were able to move the way we did was that we were able to, with the help of our realtor access a an rd loan rural development loan yeah. which re- did not require a down payment yeah. like the one we had for the house in saginaw right and had we needed to pay a down payment without being able to sell our old house and after all these on and off and there job nothing, situations there was nothing there there was nothing there, was right. nothing there. so no so assets yeah. to show to a an ultimate what, what ended up happening officer. at the end yeah we had no choice but to but to leave right yeah so all right everyone that's the story stick it to it do you feel good about getting it out i do i do we've been threatening for so long yeah so here it is this i don't even know how long we've been going but i'll find out and now i've got to get it processed and blow it and then get out to bed and then start all over monday morning anyway i hope this will at all that's all yeah. I just hope it all went Me down. too. I keep looking over at the computer. Is it working? All right. Well, I love you very much. And like I said, hope is a discipline. And every day we hope to, to see it getting better. Yeah, back at you, babe. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Wait, wait. There's more. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podscast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye. Bye.